close and secure all possible entrances to your home. Switch off all lights. Do not look out of any windows. Do not respond to any knocks on your windows or doors until the all clear is given. Remain silent at all times. It's like, this news too cool for long sentences. He said the key words. He said, streaming live around the world. This is Paper Cuts. We call it a poop bag. With Brad and Jay. Yeah, it's got a new show. It came to you, like, basically straight from my brain. And we're not going to have those devil books in here. We are live. You know, if we keep taking these long breaks in between shows, I'm going to forget how to do this. But it's just just like riding a bike, Brad. What's Stop going on? You, know, you never forget. I'm doing exactly. good, man. How are you doing? Well, what's up, everyone? Welcome back to another exciting episode of Paper Cuts. My name is Jay. Thanks so much for joining us. With me for 97% of the time, that's Brad over there. I think it's like 98% now. Dude, I'm going to do the math. What, which episode okay. is What number of episode is this? We're on, I don't know, 24. Okay, so I, I'll figure out the math because you missed the show. <laughs> Um, but enough about us. We are joined by the legendary. I don't know if he's really legendary or not, but we're going to say is he's Max legendary. Booth the third. And I made sure I got the third part in there just for extra emphasis. Yeah, we don't need to credit my dad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's not to be confused with anyone else, not with the other two Maxes. What's going yeah, on, Max? Not much. Just talking thanks, to you guys. What's yeah, going thanks on? So much for, uh, thanks so much for hopping on here and joining us. I mean, because you are a star. And we oh, are yeah. in the presence of a star. So. <laughs> Is that so? <laughs> <laughs> so? Let's go with it and see what happens. Okay. We'll, we'll throw it against the wall, see if it sticks. See if it I sticks. am pretty famous. That's right. <laughs> you are. So I'm going to hit you with the hard-hitting, deep question right off the bat that everyone wants to know the answer to. And yeah. it's how do you like your eggs? Do you like them scrambled? Do you like them fried, over easy? Devil. Man, it's a difficult question because I like mm-hmm. all types of eggs. So my go-to is to get um, what's called a breakfast taco in Texas, at least. And nice. it's not a it's not a burrito; it's a taco. So you have like eggs and cheese, and you know, bacon sometimes, maybe some chorizo. Um, I also like just getting like two frozen waffles and you know t- toasting those and making a fried egg and making a little egg sandwich with that that's pretty good i could talk <laughs> about eggs for the next two hours that was so. totally my dinner by the way too right? it was uh yeah just bacon and egg on on texas toast nice. yeah i mean I'm, it wasn't you know legit texas toast i'm in Columbus, <laughs> ohio so it wasn't legit right. texas toast but it has some mayo on it and fried egg and bacon and that was my dinner so eggs are like the only evidence i've seen that god is real <laughs> so that's, is that, that's, is a, that... that's a quote that's that's a sound bite right there for our promo <laughs> yeah. is that why uh you died by eggs in your uh 100th episode of ghoulish <laughs> you like eggs i don't know so why well? i died by eggs i don't know the reason why my assassin thought to kill me but <laughs> it happened well that sort of ties into maggot screaming so are you you might be the real max you might be the dead max we don't know i mean that's the question anyone has to ask themselves am i the alive one or am i the dead one right. let, let me just no ask asshole. before we get too far to that like what were you under the influence when you <laughs> when you wrote maggot screaming by the way i mean was there any kind Coffee. of just coffee okay coffee and just (laughs) like insane amounts of happiness i was writing (laughs) i was writing a good chunk of it in michigan when we were making we need to do something so i wrote like twenty five thousand builds of it at least while sitting in the editing room of the movie in between like loading up the new scene so i was feeling pretty good and that isn't a, a typical sensation i have it, it, it comes <laughs> across that way because like there are parts where i was reading it thinking okay somebody else would have stopped already but he's still going on with this <laughs> conversation and i just got so wrapped up into it laughing my ass off about it and it's just it, it, it's not your typical in your face horror type you know book that we're used to because there's so much comedy in it that uh it just, it just it, it's special <laughs> it's special and, and i know you, you tweeted uh what was it, about a couple hours ago or about um <laughs> uh publisher weekly or whoever decided, yeah. decided not to review it that's i'll okay. let you i'll let you know both of us will review it okay we're, we're going to review you. it for you uh because we're on the same level as publishers weekly. yeah because you don't know, forget them 
Yeah. We'll review I, it. I agree. We'll it it, it may not be a five in my book because you didn't make a character named after me, but uh <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, but, just just imagine well, someone named Zach in it. Just imagine his name is Jay. Okay. Well, <laughs> I mean, we have connections, so Hi, Laurel, if, you, if you're going to watch this later, by the way. <laughs> just a side note, I did try to get Laurel Hightower to come on tonight, and, and she totally refused. Just She was like, <laughs> she said, no. that Max guy's going to be on there. I can't Yeah, can't she's like, screw that. that. Yeah, really, she's, she, had a, she's had yeah. a bad experience with ghoulish books, so I'm not surprised. <laughs> Already. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Really, really, she, ha she has, like, family in and she, they're visiting, and she's going to watch yeah. it later. So, so. I mean, that, that's, that's, that's the excuse she gave me. That's told, me not to, not, told me not to, you know, talk smack, but uh, yeah, just, you know, yeah. So what was to wave? Uh, you can I don't know. Yeah. I, 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 just waving at people coming into the chat here. <laughs> oh, that's who you're waving at. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so what was the uh, what was the the brain the ideas for Baggett screaming? Because it's so bizarre and very different than anything I've read before. Did it just come out of nowhere? Is it something you've been thinking about for a while? Or yeah, I guess the the main genesis of it is. Myself, my wife, and my stepson, we were digging up an old uh, gelding in the backyard. And I like to sometimes spook him. And I said, what if we found a body in this in this hole? And he didn't like that. And then I <laughs> leaned in closer and I said, what if the body was you? <laughs> and also his nice. name is Dylan, so, nice. which is the name of the kid in the book as well. And um, <laughs> um, yeah, he didn't like any of that. And, I, and much like with my last book, We Need to Do Something, which was a uh, which came to life after we were trapped and well we weren't trapped we had locked ourselves in the bathroom doing a tornado warning and i mm -hmm. said to uh the step kids uh what would happen if we got stuck in this bathroom and <laughs> no one came to save us and so i did something kind of similar with that and just based on like how unsettled he seemed it felt uh -huh. like a like something i should think about fiddle as a potential book idea and then just kind of yeah, went into that direction. You just totally gave away all your secrets that you write about <laughs> real life. <laughs> yeah. I just, I, I like to just ask a lot of what ifs to children and if they seem terrified. <laughs> like, like the main still, my inspiration is still to school, like a couple blocks from my house. And like, I, well, I bought this van recently. And it's <laughs> so. So no one could look in and see like what's in my van, like my my writing equipment. I've painted it black, the windows. <laughs> so I like to leave that by the school. And like when kids pass, I, I ask them like hypothetical <laughs> questions. And if they, you know, if they want to participate, I do give them like candy and stuff. <laughs> I knew yeah. I was coming. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and now we're being watched by the FBI. I, I appreciate that. <laughs> oh, sweet. <laughs> nice. Max's sure. friend, his first name basis is the FBI guys. <laughs> hey, Ted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah change your uh wi-fi uh password or, or username to fbi <laughs> i always like doing that so so with in maggot screaming that's the only book of yours i read are your books normally as comedic as that one or is that one sort of different than what you've done before most of them are pretty comedic i think yeah is that something that just naturally comes for you and the comedy in there i think so yeah i've talked about this a bit in the past but i think comedy and uh, spookiness they kind of go hand in hand sometimes mm -hmm. just on a like a pacing issue and what i mean by that is i'm pale phrasing things i've said like in essays before so forgive me if this is pretty uh, brief but no you're good i think like a good way to skill somebody is to catch them off guard meaning mm -hmm. if you kind of trick them into a scene with comedy and then you get hit like with an abrupt scale, it's going to surprise them. And the same yeah. thing can happen if you switch those around. So like if you have something pretty unsettling and skilly going on, and then you end that with like a punchline, they're not going to expect a joke to suddenly <laughs> pop up. and It's going to make them la laugh even harder. I hope. Yeah. It's that extremes of emotions. You're either dying yeah. laughing or then you're terrified and the, the jump in between the two. It's a natural fill to 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 mix the the scares with the the, the laughs and the comedy. I think 
it relieves some tension let's just say yeah, yeah. <laughs> and plus comedy you know if you do it right it's fun it's entertaining and you right. want people to be entertained in the book you want them to keep breathing you want them to have a good time so it seems like comedy is the best way to do that yeah it, it's um it's a nice way for someone to like catch their breath if it's like super intense or you know super dark moments or whatever then you add in those little bits of comedy here and there and sprinkle it out throughout yeah, I agree. I'm going to wave anytime I see a comic. Go for it. Go for it. Okay. So uh, for those wondering which book we're talking about, Maggot Screaming uh, is uh, Max's newest book. When's it coming? Is it April coming Come, out? Or? April April 12th or 22nd? I think it's the 12th. Okay. okay. And it's being released yeah. on your new imprint, uh, Ghoulish, correct? Yeah. Ghoulish Books. Ghoulish Indeed. Books. It just uh, a side note: the first one being released is in March. We're in March now, right? From yeah. uh, Laura Hightower called Below. Uh, not that you know you don't deserve her, but how'd you get Laura Hightower <laughs> to be the first release for ghoulish books? I've been asking that question a few times lately, and I, I don't know. She uh, reached out to me and. S- basically said, well, you guys opening full novella soon because I have a new book and I want to put it out quickly because I'm going to Stokel Con and I would love to have copies ready in time. And I said, well, let's see what it is. <laughs> and it skilled the shit out of me. I'm not easily like terrified in the books I read, but that book is really intense. Yeah. And I, I was left no choice. I had to accept it. And lo and behold, it but it's obviously the, the right choice to launch the new imprint on with. We were already uh, considering this imprint and getting uh, below. It just kind of concreted the choice to go and move filled with it. Why I think, make, uh, uh, I'm just, I think Crossroads, her novella Crossroads kicked off Off Limits Press, too. I think she launched that, yeah. too. I think so, yeah. Yeah, I mean, even she's good. She's good at launching presses. <laughs> yeah, even if it wasn't scary, it's Laura Hightower. You kind of have to take it, no matter what, and and, and yeah. find a way to uh, to get it out there in the world for us. So, <laughs> if it was bad, if I didn't like it, I would have rejected it. I rejected yeah. uh, some people. You would be surprised to really. Yeah, is, is that for the off-air discussion or? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not going to name them. That's, okay, that's rude, but. Yeah, I mean Stephen King, he had a shot. He lost. <laughs> was, was that Stephen just, Stephen R. I just King? It. Yeah, <laughs> it was. But he spelled his name different. That's all. No, I would accept that. I would. Have, I, re- I respect a good scam. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I love a good con artist. Which the the sad thing is that guy, if that is actually his real name, and everyone just thinks he's just an a hole trying to rip off Stephen King, but it's like, no, my name is actually Stephen Robert King, guys. So come on. Yeah, but come on, if that's your name, you have a responsibility to just come up with a pseudonym. Really? Just just and he uses like the same exact fonts and puts it on there exactly the same. Just like go by the initials or something, you know. He knows what he's doing. SRK. He does. (laughs) Did you see that uh, Stephen King killed John Lennon? No. Is that is this one of those Tales making its way around the internet because I thought I heard something like this before. Evidently, that's a pretty uh, strong theory uh, operated by one man in San Diego with a bus. <laughs> he drives around and he has like graffiti on his van that says like Stephen King killed John Lennon. He has a website and like um, like a book he wrote that he like printed out and stapled <laughs> himself. It's pretty. Nice. Uh, I mean, he's pretty convincing. I think he did. Do you know what any of his facts are? Nope. Nope. <laughs> you just think he did it anyway. <laughs> I mean, if you tell me someone did something, I'll believe it. Yeah. Yeah. And then run with it and, and make a story of it. That's the way to yeah. do it. I'll just talk about it on podcasts and hope people believe me. <laughs> that's that's my motto. Spreading misinformation. Nice. That sounds like other people doing podcasts. Yeah. <laughs> I won't man. name their names. I'm looking for those Spotify. Oh, good. <laughs> was, was that some shade you were throwing there just a second ago, Brad? Uh, show it Joe Rogan, yeah, because like that's gonna matter at all. <laughs> I know, really. Yeah, he's gonna have us shut down. Like, <laughs> would you? Did you guys ever watch his show? He used to have. Well, they would eat bugs and like oh, jump yeah. off, jump off a plane or something. What was it? Fear yeah. something. Fear, fear factor. Fear yeah. factor. That's it. Yeah. Was that what it okay. Yeah. yeah. Would you yeah, guys have eaten like slugs and shit? Well, it depends on how much money we're talking. 
Did they like win just a million? for podcast it, fame. Oh, just for podcast fame? No. Oh, no. Oh, don't uh, don't open those boxes I sent both of you. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was going to do like a live, like I was going to do like a live bo- unboxing of whatever. Okay. Thanks for the warning. Yeah. There. Appreciate it. Man Absolutely. has heart attack on live air. That go that go viral. I'd retweet <laughs> that. Was that would sell me some books? I think. I think it was just a couple. <laughs> Just a box of maggots for both of you. Oh, that would be disgusting. My little, my I, wife won't eat rice because she says it looks like maggots. So an actual box of maggots would probably freak her out real bad. I bought a uh, bag of fake uh, maggots that I'm going to include in uh, every uh, preordal of maggots screaming from nice. my website. Just they nice. feel and smell disgusting. I don't know if they will <laughs> actually fake. You, you get a little. Out. Get a little fake blood and rub on each yeah. one. You should have there. somehow got a recording of the sound that maggots make. So as soon as we opened up the book, it's like yeah, you know, like, like a, a Christmas per- card, like a perfect card with <laughs> with audio, like yeah, <laughs> that's the sound they make. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I was trying to I was trying to figure it out because I never heard it before. I just if you so, lean close enough to a maggot, you'll just feel <laughs> <laughs> like like when I was reading that, I was thinking, is it anything like Rice Krispies? How it's kind of yeah. <laughs> he says that in the book. It's like yeah. pouring milk on Rice Krispies. So I so, so I, some of the research I was doing with this book, I read a book called Stiff by Millie Roach, and it's all about how bodies decompose and things people do with bodies. And there's one scene in that book, it's nonfiction, and she mentions the sound of many maggots together wriggling in a, like a, in a big ball of maggot stuff. Mm-hmm. Sounds like Rice Krispies uh, with milk going over it. Yeah. And when I read that, I thought, oh, wait, that's the sound of maggot screaming. And the title just came yeah. like that. Nice. nice. That's, a, that's a cool title, by the way. Yeah. It's very, it's weird to think that maggots make noise because you don't think that like, they would make a noise, but if it, it's even more disturbing that they sound like Rice Krispies. <laughs> you're eating your cereals, like, oh, that could be maggots you're eating. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if they make like an audible noise, like from the little maggot lungs. I think it's more like just, just the, the noise bodies, on each other, like the wetness of them, like just. Yeah, I don't think I've like, looked yeah. at them long enough to wait for a sound to come. It's always like you see him, you put the lid back on something, or you spray him with a hose or something. You know what I mean? So yeah, so there's lots of fun videos uh, <laughs> you can look up on YouTube that has like the audio uh, intensified of maggots, and that's what it sounds like. Well, I mean, that's the the change I'm doing to my YouTube channel. I'm, I'm going <laughs> maggots and the sounds they make starting this weekend. So no, oh, yeah, that's I would love a CD like that to fall asleep to <laughs> the, the 10 hour loop on repeat just yes. the same Sound noise of over and over. <laughs> yeah, so nice. with your with your research was any of that kind of disturbing we're talking about bodies decomposing to you at all or is it just didn't really bother you at all um the, the most disturbing thing i saw and folks watching could google if they they wish <laughs> is so something called maggot therapy and there's a wikipedia page phil and i went on that page uh an innocent man and left it a really <laughs> distilled person because there's a big ass photo on the front page of that showing what maggot therapy is and for those who don't know what it is I'll tell i gotta you. look now while you're talking about it Let's oh see. please do maggot therapy <laughs> wikipedia um, I refuse to go back to it because it's the most disgusting thing I've seen in quite some time. It's ba- basically if a way to treat like necrosis on a wound to like eat away at all the dead flesh is they would put maggots on it and the mag- maggots won't live. What the won't freak? Eat- <laughs> <laughs> maggots will eat a uh, living uh, material. It only chows down on dead shit. So it will yeah. eat the bad stuff on the wound and leave the rest for you to continue, I don't know, living it's, with. It's got a so diabetic you, foot on the yeah. so you put on like your uh your brown recruit brown recluse spider bite and let yeah. eat away at that. Describe what you were looking at, Jay. Oh, it's <laughs> it's it's like a crater in it's a like foot. A crater. Yeah. <sighs> is it is it is it a gift? Does it does it move? No. No, no, no. But it looks Just like a pieces of rice <laughs> tim mcgregor why did i look <laughs> i know did, did he look uh, yeah. yeah i hope it's anyone like... who's watching tonight is uh eating dinner yeah, yeah exactly yeah it's gonna be a gross episode folks so just speckle in well brad what, will put a it? link to it down I'll link in, in it, yeah, the, yeah. <laughs> like <laughs> websites we talked about here <laughs> maggots there maggot therapy wikipedia 
So I think I even talk about it in the book, but I can't recall <clears throat> now. I think yeah, it's pretty the, gross. The doctor was talking about it. Uh, How yeah. do you say her name? Winsengreed. Yeah. Winsengreed. It's my uh, my wife's maiden name. <laughs> okay. Really? Yeah, I love it. It's a good name. So you got Dylan. You got your wife's maiden name in there. Does, do you know a, a real Andy and Miguel and everything? Or yeah, Andrew and Miguel, well, some of my best friends. Well, someone named Zach in it, who's only mentioned briefly when they do a when they're walking around the body film. They see a guy who uh, has a Boondock oh, yeah. Saints T-shirt on <laughs> and Crocs. Nice. Yeah. And, yeah. That's they said Zach. he was an asshole or whatever, right? Yeah. Piece of shit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that body farm just seemed. T- too realistic like oh, does that real. exist okay yeah many of them yeah the the one in the book t- is in sam elko's texas and it's a real one it's the biggest one in the u.s unfortunately when i emailed the <laughs> facility asking to uh look around they said my presence would be disrespectful to the bodies <laughs> so i hope i did them justice <laughs> <laughs> like okay we're gonna write whatever we want to write then because you won't let me in I can't oh. believe they denied me. I that would have been so great mad. if you would have got if you would have got pictures too. To I got to. some. I got some like outside of the place because I yeah. drove up. It's a long drive. Like in the book, those those quite a long drive, and that's the same the real drive. Right. Yeah. But I couldn't go beyond the locked entrance. But like those really a, a big rock. Well, someone has spray painted the real Jesus for some reason. All of that's real. I have photos. <laughs> Jesus someplace. rock. Yeah. <sighs> I, I would assume they'd have to keep it away from people because the smell and everything be so bad like could you from how far away you were could you smell anything at all or i couldn't smell anything no i wish i no i'm glad i didn't no, you... <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah it would it would have been the smell of death literally i wonder what yeah. what was what's worse that body farm or that the uh the flower the the corpse flower the corpse flower yeah i, I bet you it's probably about the same <clears throat> yeah because we had a we had a friend on the show recently, and he lives in California. And he went to San Diego like a month or two ago, and one bloom there, he got to go smell it. He said it was disgusting. I've never smelled one. I have no desire to. Yeah, I don't. <laughs> no, I don't either. It's not like, like a, I, a party on a Saturday night. Hey, let's go smell death. <laughs> yeah, for those uh, watching, we were talking about a kilt's flower, which mm-hmm. is which is like a giant uh, phallic shaped uh, flower. And when it blooms, it uh, secretes the uh, the scent of rotting flesh to attract like insects and whatnot. It's a it's real. Um, I I think it's a cool looking flower. I've always they're really they're really big it. too and pretty too. And I would, are, are they rare or is it? I, I think I they're really the rare. Story about how he yeah. went. It was a special occasion when he went to yeah, because it, it was like a some botanical thing, and they had the live stream on there, like waiting yeah. for it to bloom. And he saw it bloomed at like four o'clock in the morning, so he drove down there. Yeah, I think, I they, think and they only bloom for like twenty four hours or something really short time span, and then they they close I think back so. up. I think it's been a while. The last time I researched them, I was uh, seventeen in science class, <laughs> <laughs> and most of the chapter is just my science repeal, copy and paste. <laughs> <laughs> I did like the I guess chapter titles or part titles. They were the different phases of decomposition. Like at first, I didn't realize what was going on, and then right. when I got yeah. in, it was like okay, that's cool. Oh, thank you. Uh, Cause that, cause I, didn't, so, I didn't see any chapters at first. I was like, wait a second. Yeah. And I forgot. <laughs> yeah, I, said, I was like, are there chapters in this book? Yeah. <laughs> this is good. yeah, it's it's broken up into five sections. Uh, I know you guys know this. Yeah. And um, because it's the five um, stages of decomposition and the people in the book will just slightly spoil a bit of it. They'll rapidly mm-hmm. decomposing while uh, they will still alive. Yeah. So the best way I discovered to outline a book like that would be to break it up by the stages of decomposition. So I knew like, will they need to be at any given point in the yeah. time of the decay? Yeah. Like the first one was like autolysis or something. Yeah. I was like, I don't know what that means. And then the next one was like bloat or whatever. So like, oh, okay. I, yeah. I get what he's doing now. Yeah. It's a autolysis, which is just a yeah. fancy way of saying like fresh basically. Uh-huh. And then those bloat and <clears throat> active decay. Although some people say like, Oh, first you have active decay and then you have advanced decay, but they're so close in my mind. I just kind of milge them as one. And then after that you have either skeletonization or possibly mummification mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. depending on like the, the surroundings of your decom- uh, decomposing uh, surroundings. I said that like an idiot, but you know what I mean. <laughs> the, what, the, your climate and environment and everything. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, we've gave away the whole book by now. 25 yeah, minutes. We... 
I, I love the, uh, the the Simpsons uh, watching the Simpsons throughout the whole. Like I felt yeah. like I was a kid again, like watching all of those. Simpsons. <laughs> I, I, I was like a connection there. So I love the Simpsons. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's just a constant repeat. I haven't I haven't watched it in the last you know maybe ten years. I feel bad about that, but I'm getting old. So you don't need to. <laughs> I, I I've seen them and well because because there's there's actually a reference where you make like something about the the new ones, uh, Dylan liking the new ones and and yeah. Yeah. So. And and uh, the the real deal, and he loves the new ones. So I mean, <laughs> nice. although I'll, I'll say this, there was a recent episode in the last season that had probably an all time Simpsons joke, and no one talks about it. So Mo, the the, the barrel tendril, yeah. he uh, he has something in his mouth, something rotten, and he spits it out. He says something like, "Oh, geez, I haven't had something that jolly in my mouth since my dad's gun." <laughs> <laughs> That's a little what dark. A I got what dark. Wow. Is, is that the oh, direction they went? <laughs> I mean, the Simpsons have always had like some of that going on. Right. And once yeah. in a while, you get hit with one of those jokes. And it's so unexpected when they do, it usually hits you all that much stronger. Like, like, that sounds the, more the like something is, a family guy would do than the Simpsons. It, well, I mean, the thing exactly. is, like, I watched and The Simpsons it, from the get go. Like the original, like the original one showing on the Tracy Allman show. Yeah, and what was I was maybe 10 years, nine or 10 when it came out, and I watched it. and There were so many adult jokes, I never got it until like later on, you know. And my daughter is 12, right? Yeah, 12. And sure. uh, she, hopefully, my wife's not watching the show coming, but yeah, my, <laughs> so she started, they're on Disney now. It is, so she started, she started oh, watching. I thought they turned them down on Disney, didn't they? No, well, they didn't. Originally, they did. They they cut out a few things, you know, and they and they messed up the the framing, the ratio. Yeah, yeah it, ratio. you know, it's got to be four three, like the original one, because half the jokes are cut out, you know, and they try to stretch them, and half the jokes are cut out because of that, and then they moved it back to four three, so you can see the jokes. But she watched an episode or two, and she's like, didn't care much for it because all <laughs> of the adult jokes were just right over her head. I'm like, yep. yeah. I remember that. I was like seven or eight, nine when they first started or whatever. And just like just remembering all that stuff. Man, sometimes you watch that in Disney. And I know the dad in the book gets really pissed at this, but so do I. How like how <laughs> dare you give me the option to skip the, the intro? Like that's oh, yeah. why you watch you gotta you gotta know what Bart is writing on the board. Right? Yeah. <clears throat> and the intros are it's always something different. It's not like it's the yeah. same exact thing every time. Like who, right. what, how are they sitting on the couch and what's going on on the couch yeah, and everything? The couch, the couch part's different. Well, Bart's writing on the board is different. Sometimes when Maggie gets scanned, it says a different thing. So, yeah, you got to watch yeah. it. And I, I mean, I have like all the DVDs available. I think they stopped at season 17 and then they released like two mold down the line, but that's it. And they just gave up like so many other companies just giving up on physical media. Yeah. I mean, Fox specifically kind of abandoned all disc stuff a while back mm-hmm. that kind of goes with the times too it's like everything is digital or streaming now you can't do the physical media much anymore like your movie by the way out there digital <laughs> on Hulu. yeah yeah it might is it- one day be a physical release i don't know no one tells me anything <laughs> i mean if, if it does come if it does come out on blu-ray uh, i recorded a commentary track like a nice. year ago. Did so you really? That would be nice. nice. Yeah, I, I did it with uh, the director, Sean King O'Grady, and the uh, movie editor, Shane Patrick Field. It was a fun time, so I hope it comes out one day. Does it kind of blow your mind that your movie's on Hulu, like this giant streaming service? Yeah, it's been awesome. Like, we feel it was on Hulu. I mean, people were watching it, but I think the audience greatly uh, increased once it was added to Hulu. Mm-hmm. Because that's you, not just uh, like some rinky-dink you know, right. direct on demand video thing. That's like one of the big three, like Hulu, Netflix, HBO. That's pretty cool. Yeah. IFC, they have a deal with Hulu. Mm-hmm. Basically, Hulu pays IFC a like annual licensing fee. And so anything they make, Hulu can just dump on the streaming channel. So I knew it was going to go on Hulu, but I didn't know when. And when it was mm-hmm. added, I didn't even know. And I did the direct <laughs> because IFC didn't tell us. We found out when the we saw like a new movies added the Hulu list. <laughs> yeah, I remember I was just scrolling on, on Hulu. It was like, oh, look, there's Max's movie on there. I was like, oh, that's cool. Yeah. 
it, and, and I'll tell the story just to get out of the way here. But when I watched it, and it's been a couple months since I watched it, you know, and you're probably sick of hearing this because you've probably heard it before. But I watched it and I texted Brad. I was like, I could debunk this movie right away <laughs> because, uh, you know, bathrooms don't have doors to open out like that. And then after I told him that, I come downstairs in my basement in my dungeon that I'm in now that I've yeah. lived in this house for I don't know how long, several different times. I turn the corner, there's a bathroom around there, and the door opens out. <laughs> so, yeah, I would also like to point to anyone who doesn't believe that bathrooms do not open out to look behind me because there was a bathroom duel. Yeah, point it out. That's the bathroom. <laughs> That was Frank. He was pissed. <laughs> yeah, he's, a, he's agreeing. Yeah. yeah, the bathroom in my master bedroom opens out, and I told James like I've seen bathroom doors open out before, and like I didn't even realize my own bathroom door does that until I like yeah. looked at it one day. I was like, oh shit, mine does too. I mean, I, I did uh, I did a show from down here, and I just turned the corner. I'm like, oh <laughs> shit, mine opens out too. <laughs> I didn't realize it was such a touchy subject until this movie <laughs> went into production. I mean beginning with um, some potential producers and uh, people who wanted to maybe invest in the movie. Yeah. That was like the main criticism from day one, like bathroom tools don't open out. And it took me like, I had a, I took a video on my phone of me opening my deal and like <laughs> walking in and I emailed it to them. They did not respond to me, which is funny. <laughs> <laughs> but um, eventually they stopped uh, being uh, pretty, um, stupid about it and but like re even reviews now like i'll browse them sometime and that's like the main thing i always see it's like yeah i've yeah. never seen a bathroom duel that opens out talk about a plot hole like what are you talking <laughs> about <laughs> but like and they like, can they can like believe anything else that happens in the movie but they can't yeah, spend the, disbelief. the door going the other way <laughs> <laughs> so it's so funny to me and like even even if the door opened in like for people who haven't seen the movie, the tree could have crashed and still blocked him in, even though the door could have swung the other way. They still could have been trapped. Yeah. Just... yeah. That would have been too obvious, though. So, no, he had, <laughs> he had to make I just, I just think it's funny for people to nitpick about, like, the tiniest, that tiniest little detail, like, yeah. and all this other crazy stuff is happening. Like, oh, that's good. I'm not worried about that. <laughs> so, LJ, uh, LJ has a question in here about the movie. Okay. It has one of his favorite jump scares of all time. He's curious about the process for writing those types of scenes that are more, more often seen in film than in books. Yeah, so some spoiler worlds. Well, um, we need to do something. It's The book's been out a year and a half. Movie came out in December, September, so I'm spoiling some of it. Um, halfway through, like a half hour into the movie, a little over halfway into the book, they'll seal in the bathroom because that's where the, the story takes place, and they hear some noise like a dog sniffing outside the bathroom too. So the boy, he opens it, he sticks his hand through, and he begins laughing. He's like, oh, God, it's a dog, guys. It's really a dog. And the, the, the sister who's narrating the book, she sticks her hand through, and sure enough, it's a dog. And they'll both, it's a moment of, like, hope, right? Because they've gone through all this bleakness before then. So now they have, like, a just a, a friendly dog welcoming them. And it's supposed to be this nice, uplifting thing. And the kid, the boy, is saying, who's a good boy? Who's a good boy? And after he says that, a demonic voice from outside the duel says, I'm a good boy. And then <laughs> uh, grabs a hold of the, the sister and tries to draggle through the opening. And yeah, I, I feel as like how I came up with that is going to be a pretty lame answer. <laughs> because I always had something grabbing the system and trying to draggle through mm -hmm. on, on original drafts. It didn't say anything, but while revising, like almost like when I was completely done with the book, I'm just proofreading it. And I get to that section and I thought it would be pretty funny if he said something. <laughs> I just added that dialogue. I never thought it would be like this, Billy really talked about jump skill or anything, but that's the one thing, even like the bad reviews, they seem to compliment that one specific moment. And yeah. it was just like a, like a whimsy. That would be funny. <laughs> and I just threw it on. So is a, uh, is that scene in the movie true to how it is in the book then pretty much? Yeah, pretty. I think it's exactly identical, except in the movie, it's voiced by Ozzy Osbourne. Yeah, that was reason. cool. How did that happen? 
Um, what's well, up to me? Um, <laughs> one of the producers on the movie is um, Donovan Leach. Letch. He played one of the main guys in the remake of the blob and he's been, he has a lot of stuff going on in music. And so did his dad. His dad did like the song from Zodiac. Okay. Um, I think his dad just went by the name Donovan. Um, so his son, Donovan Jr., I guess he's a producer on the movie and he just has lots of musician uh, connections and he reached out to Ozzy and <laughs> he said, yes, that's pretty cool. So is the movie overall, uh, pretty true to the book or, or was there a lot of, uh, you know, you always hear about movies changing things where there are a lot of changes. Cause I haven't, I I haven't mean, read the book yet either myself. I probably it's read, mostly, but... uh, it's mostly faithful to what happens in the book. There's a few things. The movie doesn't really take place in Texas like the book does. Okay. So I've lost a lot of like the dad's uh, Texan ways. Uh, mm -hmm. Those more uh, odd nine 11 conspiracy theories in the book. Um, <laughs> Um, there's some pretty uh disturbing things that happen that I won't spoil. Okay. In the I'll, I'll say this in the movie, the dad almost does something before he's interrupted by a by a song. In the book, mm -hmm. he does he's not interrupted. He does it while the rest of the family watches. Oh, okay. So that's mostly and plus I've cut like dialogue and you know, I've trimmed scenes down and like rewrote certain things to make it look more cinematic, but mostly mm -hmm. the same. So, so how did how, how did the process go? Like were you approached by Spin Black Yarn to do this, or was it something you pitched out to just whoever and they picked it up, or how did it go? Yeah, so and I think it was December 2019. I was approached by a TV company asking some questions that I did not know how to answer about a book of mine called Touch the Night. And mm -hmm. I didn't want to respond to this guy by myself, and I did not have any representation at the time. So I reached out to a friend of mine named Josh Mandelman, and I asked him if he could maybe help me. And he connected me with his own uh, TV and film manager, Ryan Lewis, after some phone calls with Ryan, and after Ryan read Touch the Night, he offered to be my TV and film manager, and he began helping me like with the the company interested in Touch the Night, which, by the way, was uh, recently bought by a pretty big streaming channel, and I, I can't say who, because nice. nothing's been announced, but it's pretty exciting. It's yep. going to be a TV show, assuming, oh, I mean, I mean, hopefully, nothing's finalized until it's on TV. But right. it's looking promising. That's cool. It's a show. They give it more room to breathe instead of a movie. Uh, yeah, I think I think it's going to be good. I'm excited with like who we have attached to uh, writing the show. Um. Anyway, so after Ryan became my manager, we began talking about other books I've written and really want to see my career going. Mm -hmm. And a few months pass, and I finish a new novella. We need to do something. I sent it to Ryan. He sees lots of potential in it as a film. So over the next month or so, we I write a draft of a script. I send it to him. He gives me notes. I write a new draft and so on. And once we are both happy with that, Ryan sends it to a company called Atlas Industries, asking if they want to help produce the movie. And little did we know that the at the time, the uh, the co-owner of Atlas, Sean King O'Grady, was looking to direct his debut film. Before then, he had directed documentaries, but he wanted to do like a, a movie movie now. Uh -huh. And this seemed perfect because this is <laughs> this. I think we sent it to him at the end of June, June of 2020, which is big in the COVID. And mm -hmm. most movies cannot be made. But this specific script takes place in one bat one room with a limited cast and not a lot happens outside of that room. Right. So if anyone's going to make any movie during a pandemic, this seemed like a pretty good one to go with. So yeah. Sean reached out and said, I want to direct this. And after many meetings, uh, we signed on. And lots of other meetings trying to get money for the movie, trying to cast the movie. I think I zoomed with Sean in July of 2020 when I, when he told me he wanted to make the movie and we began filming in the end of September. That's pretty quick for a movie. Yeah. Yeah, it was it was lightning fast, man. 
it's like as far as the decisions in the movie, like casting or like while they're actually on set, did you have much say at all about what was going on or were you just kind of there? I was, I was pretty involved with the casting yeah. and a lot of other things. I don't know if that's because it's a small uh, production company and mm -hmm. they just let you do that compared to big companies. Well, if I was also uh, given an executive producer credit, and I think that's mostly a, a useless uh, credit, but that might also be why they uh, let me be in, as involved <laughs> as I was. So yeah, um, like the main lead of the movie is a Hill and McKilnick. That was my choice. I brought it all to them after seeing a movie called The Vast of Night. And it just so happened that Sean, well, maybe it was Ryan, I can't recall now, knew Sahil and McCoolman's uh, talent manager. So we reached out to her and she was like the first one to sign on. She nice. did really good too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We only did auditions for two, two of the roles that the boy and um, the lead's uh, love interest, Amy. So mm -hmm. because both of those were mostly unknowns. So we we watched hundreds of auditions emailed to us until we found the right ones. Yeah. I mean, they all seem like they fit. I mean, they, they were believable as, as far as the parts go. So that was... Oh, I love them was, all, yeah. That was pretty cool. So if they... For any of the parts that they may have changed, they run all of the changes by you first to make sure it's cool or... To get what your, kind of changes? And, if, if they made any kind of changes away from the, the the book to the movie, were there many changes? You said very minimal, but did they run anything by you first just to make sure things were you know, matched? Well, up I wrote better, the or? I wrote the screenplay, so okay. yeah, so I wrote the screenplay, so that was already done. And after they accepted it and said they wanted to make the movie, we did do some little like meetings and notes about things we could change. Right. Like the one thing that's really coming to mind at the moment that we had to change, it was more of us just a scheduling conflict with the no one for some reason could find a school to rent because mm -hmm. there's a scene, like there's like a, a flashback type of scene in the movie mm. that has a classroom. And they were having so much trouble trying to get that. So then they were like, okay, what if you rewrote it to take place like in a gymnasium? So I did that. And then they had trouble doing that. <laughs> and then I had to rewrite it again to take place like on uh, like uh, bleach holes, the stadium. Yeah, like, tra like a trap. Yeah. Yeah. And I did that. And then like, oh, now, now it's going too long. Can you re can you condense it? I'm not super happy with how that stuff in the movie came out because it, it was a lot of back and forth. And I eventually at one point said, what dialogue do you want them to say in this scene? Because <laughs> what I had no longer will make sense. And you guys aren't loving the new stuff. So you just tell me and I'll copy and paste it. <laughs> so I, I'm not in love with that whole, the school stuff, but it is what it is. And that's fine. One mm -hmm. funny thing though, because we shot the school stuff, like the second, the last day of filming, we showed up and, uh, the field was occupied by a high school football team doing a practice and they wouldn't leave. So we just kind of <laughs> stood in front of them filming <laughs> stuff on the bleach olds. That makes it more realistic. They're actually doing, doing the football yeah. practice. The two girls are in the, the stands watching. Yeah. <laughs> just a big scheduling uh, mix up, I guess. I, I thought it was pretty funny. So aside from that scene, though, are, are you pretty satisfied with the, the final outcome or okay? Yeah. No, no kind of like, Damn it! I would I would have done this or different and this different, but everything. I mean, I'm not the same person Sean King and Grady is. I would right. have probably directed a few things differently. I would have. It would it would if I had made it, it would be a different movie, and I think that could mm -hmm. be said about any director. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. Sean and also the DP, um, who we call JP. He's a French man, uh, John Pihil Bonnier. I probably said it wrong. <laughs> That's why we would just call him JP. Uh, I mean, he brought his own taste to the movie, his own eye for camera work and shots. And plus we have um, Shane Patrick Field who did the editing and he has his own signature he's adding to it. And we all just have to, you know, collaborate and we try to make the best thing we can. Yeah. But um, I mean, the <laughs> once we cut the movie into like a coherent storyline, which takes months, the the first cut was like two and a half hours long, which obviously is not going to stay. Right. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad we cut a lot of it. There's a few things I wish we had kept. Like there's a there's like there's like a seven minute monologue Pat Haley does. <laughs> it's so good. And after uh, he did that take, 
Pat even said, I think that's the best acting I've ever done in my life. <laughs> and it was cut. And I, I really, I hate that it was cut. But besides that, the rest of the cuts made sense. So that needs to be the, the Blu-ray deleted scenes have his, his cut back in yeah. there. Director's cut. If there's ever a physical copy, there you go. That's the Yeah. <laughs> we have that. We have a cameo from Josh Mandelman. He has a scene that we we cut. Oh, uh, really? Be, <laughs> yeah. Um in the scene we'll, um on the stadium, the two the two uh ladies will, you know, like batting flirtatious eyes at each other. Well, we feel that uh, Josh was supposed to play like a gym coach who walks up to Melissa and is like, oh, I know you have a rough life and stuff like that. It was pretty, it was okay. Be, yeah. but <laughs> he did the great performance. The dialogue wasn't great because it was one of those things <laughs> I had to like write on the day of. And yeah, I had um, originally written like, like a three page scene between Melissa and Josh that was, uh, I guess, the best best way to describe it is uh, insane because at one point, <laughs> uh, Josh's kill until he begins ranting about uh, Thomas Ligotti. <laughs> it didn't make a lot of sense for that movie. And when we sent it off to the cast, um, to Hill and McFilmick and um, um, Lisette Alexis, who plays Amy, they were like, I don't know if this is right for this scene. They, <laughs> that would, that would have been great if he was drunk and just gone off about Ligotti. Yeah. yeah just... <laughs> <laughs> they will correct. It was a it was a good choice to cut that dialogue to like just a couple sentences. And then once we got back the footage, it was okay, but it just if we needed to cut things to make the runtime go down, that made sense to cut from the movie. Mm -hmm. So I'll just got another question real quick. Okay, go ahead. As far as the screenplay, did do they want you originally to do the screenplay or do they want somebody else to do it? Screenplay was already uh, written when we sent it to okay. them. So, yeah. Nice. Yeah. So, so with, no, a lot with, of times uh, authors don't get to write their own screenplays a lot they, of the time. They didn't have yeah. any choice. <laughs> <laughs> so with this one done and, and a little bit of uh, Touch of Night you touched on earlier, is this is this the direction that you plan on going for now on, just making everything into a movie? Are we going to see a movie of Maggot Screaming at some point? <laughs> possibly i mean that would be pretty cool yeah that'd be a, I, that'd I enjoy, be a gnarly movie complete with so. the fart jokes you gotta have the my fart yeah if i was given complete freedom to make maggots screaming a movie it would be a musical <laughs> yeah in the same vein as like little shop if oh World, shit i could i could I, I i could picture it now oh yeah. my god now that you I, said that i think it would be just magnificent we don't have a lot of musicals in that genre and i would love to throw my own into it like i could just imagine like claymation maggots with like top hats and canes just like dancing <laughs> and there's so many things that rhymes like decompose oh my god it would be it would be great like i was while reading it i was picturing like from movies like the the guy from uh, pet cemetery like hey, he's all decomposing and the guy from american werewolf in london and just the different stages yeah. they would go through all the practical effects would look fantastic it would have to be practical <laughs> it, it, yeah. would be, it would be a different person each time each stage should be somebody <laughs> else playing that <laughs> oh like that movie um fuck like johnny depp was in it uh colin phil was in it, it was, i think it was a tilly gilliam film but like throughout the ages they kept recasting the main yeah, lead yeah, yeah, someone yeah. else yeah, I can't so think each, of so each stage of decomposing yeah. it somebody else and that's the de decomposing that made it made brad pitt look like will ferrell or something like that like that <laughs> that yeah. drastic <laughs> Well, thank you, nice. Chad. I'll wave. I'm supposed to wave when I see a comment. <laughs> thank you, Chad. Sean had a question here, or kind of a statement at first. He loved the the book. He thought the bathroom was different looking than the movie, which I guess for the movie, you kind of have to do it. You have to have it big enough to fit the cameras in there and have the cast mm -hmm. moving around and yeah. stuff. Yeah, it's definitely different. The The bathroom in the book is really small to give that claustrophobic feeling to it. And mm -hmm. the movie, I mean, we went through so many different ideas for the layout. Amy Williams, who is the production designer on the movie, she's also done a lot of TV, like the show uh, Master of None. She's design mm. she designs those sets as well. Um, with, the, with the comedian, what's his name? Uh, Aziz. Aziz. Yeah. Yeah. So, with the, the we spent a lot, a lot of time trying to decide on the bathroom set, and we ended up going with the one we did for a few reasons. One. It is. It does seem big, but with like the crew, like you said, and also the camera and the director, it felt really claustrophobic, like right away. Um, yeah. And also, it's just 
the movie and the book, which I didn't realize when I was writing it, but it makes a lot of sense now, they direct like reactions to my love of the shine the shining. I mean both mm -hmm. both of those deal with a family stranded and then the dad slowly going insane due to alcoholism. So I mean it's not like too far fetched to, to say that they kind of shield that vibe. And yeah. the bathroom in my movie is mostly the same layout as like the the infamous bathroom in the shining. Mm -hmm. Like if you okay. think of that shot, well, the the kid is standing. Maybe it's the the dad. He's standing in the open doorway. He's looking at the shower, and like the creepy old lady uh -huh. has like the hand. Right. That same shot is in my movie as well, but the bathroom is on the other side of the room. It also some the 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 cuddle scheme of the bathroom is mm -hmm. designed to look like the inside of a human body. Hence, okay. like the pink and red. The pinks. The, I was going to say that. The like ribs and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a lot of fun stuff that Amy Williams uh, add, like Easter eggs, like witch, witchcraft Easter eggs throughout the bath bathroom. Those last, those last, oh my, there are lots of symbols spread through the bathroom. That, I know this was, like, there was one big tile one in the middle, but I could never really tell yeah. what it was. It's like a, it's like a, some type of a cult symbol that mm. she found in some book. I don't know what they all mean at this point. At some point she told me, but I, I lost track of them. But like, even like this, the small block windows, they'll, mm -hmm. They'll set up in three sets of six. So we have six, six, six. The, okay. the fucking hand soap is called Witch Elm, which is a bit on the nose. <laughs> but I love it. <laughs> See, all that stuff's cool. Like most of the audience will never notice any of that stuff, but for the people that do, it just makes it yeah. so much cooler. And that again would be just an extra bonus on the Blu ray copy that talking all about that. <laughs> so. I, I will say, if anyone interested in, in uh, discovering Mill about the set of the movie, when the movie was coming out in September on my podcast, Ghoulish, I had many episodes with like the crew. So I did mm -hmm. do one with Amy Williams, and she talked okay. at great length about like going into that bathroom design. So I would mm -hmm. recommend checking that out. She, is, she knows more than I do. So was the was the bathroom was it actually like a four wall set or was it split into two parts where you flip back and forth with the cameras? Does that make sense? What I'm trying to ask? Yeah, yeah. So every wall in the bathroom could be taken down. So okay. if we were filming in one direction, we would just take that wall down, right. like okay. because they uh the Atlas Industry they own a sound stage, this big garage in Michigan, and they just mm -hmm. built the bathroom in the garage. Yeah. So we could easily oh, take okay. it up and put it up, put it up just to get around with the camera. Yeah. Awesome. awesome. You want to, um, I know it's, it's, it's like movie talk, uh, before we get back into, we don't uh, ever talk about movies. I know. I know. I know. I know. We were just like diarrhea of the mouth. That's part of questions. Uh, but I do, I do want to get back into, uh, your, 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 your press, your label and all, but you want to, play a game real quick to break it up a little bit and yeah i just yeah. chilled a desk fan on is that being picked up on the audio it is but you're good it don't matter it's not real okay, out. Let me, okay. I, I need to get um the clock new phone i gotta find it hold on <laughs> you don't know where it's at all right hold on me all right i got it we're doing 60 okay. seconds or it will do 60 seconds so this is a lightning round with max booth Nice, fancy. I love it. That's that's our production. That's all our budget. <laughs> we get a five second clip. <laughs> Take that other podcast. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So we win. All right, and go. All right. What is your favorite TV show of all time? The Shield. What would your weapon of choice be in the zombie apocalypse? Duct tape. <laughs> What's your dream vacation spot? Um, a fucking cabin like in the woods, but I'm afraid of what the, the snakes would do to me. So that's <laughs> just my house. I just want to stay home. If you could have one superpower, what would it be? I, I would love to explode upon like request. Like my whole body would just explode and then like come back together just for shock value. <laughs> <laughs> what is the worst food you've ever eaten? Oh my God. Um, just like spoiled milk. Yeah. Oh. If you can meet. 
if you could meet any of your characters in real life, who would it be? Oh man, probably Dactyl Winston Reed. <laughs> Ten seconds. Deeply What's your favorite attractive. holiday? Uh, Halloween. Halloween. What Three, is the favorite book two. you have released through Perpetual Motion Machine that's Time not up. one of your books? Am I allowed to answer that? Yeah, yep, you go, go ahead. Ahead. Okay. We're not. The best. Uh, okay. <laughs> Time's up, Max. You're done. I don't. I don't. I don't know why I even had a stop. I a stopwatch. But go ahead. Um, probably Scan Lines by Todd Keeslane. That nice. it's funny. That's a reprint of a because he had it come out with a limited edition press. Yeah. It's like a hundred copies, and um, I was reading the comments. Someone suggested to drink milk with a spoon. That seems like a really slow way to drink milk. Do you mean like just to test it, or just the whole cup? Just drink it with a spoon. <laughs> that was a question that Sean asked earlier. What your favorite book has been published? That wasn't yours. Yeah. yeah so scan lines. Was, um, oh, that's gonna bother me because I know what press you're talking about. It was uh, Dim Shields, maybe. Dim Shores. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. I think so. Okay. That's I love it. that book. It's. I love any. I love '90s stuff, and that book takes place in the '90s. I mm-hmm. love like spooky media, like snuff films and things you download online that you don't mean to. And that book has it all. It's really bleak and depressing, and I love it. <laughs> now, to cheat a bit, that came out through Perpetual Motion Machine, which is a press I've run for like a decade now. Mm-hmm. And now we have launched an imprint of that called Ghoulish Books. And my favorite one we have coming out this year is actually uh below by little high title great book if you like uh creature features and uh mothman stuff <laughs> i recommend picking it up so what made you want to start a new imprint instead of just doing everything under a perpetual motion machine right what, what, what's the big difference between the two too yeah so the the difference is anything uh spooky from now on will be released under the okay. ghoulish books label. That's all okay. it is. So like IFC films, they have IFC midnight, which is what they, what they release like the spooky genre stuff on. And okay. it's just yeah. a, it's a, it's a marketing thing because no one fucking knows what perpetual motion machine <laughs> publishing means, especially if they go to like an impulse and event and they see a big sign above my table that says that it doesn't explain anything. So I uh, have regretted that name for quite a while now. And I thought it was time. Uh, We couldn't think of a name at the time. And a song called Perpetual Motion Machine by Modest Mouse was playing. We went, that's good. (laughs) (laughs) Whatever whatever pops up next. That's good. Yeah. 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 Um, I I think the name's okay, but not full spooky stuff. So Mm -hmm. it was just about time that we began to rebrand. And I hope the ghoulish books name helps us expand the audience. Yeah. Yeah. Because I mean, it, ghoulish itself, you're thinking automatically yeah. scary horror, yeah. you know, it, it, it's got to work now because you have a tattoo that you've been shown <laughs> off. So oh, yeah. Yeah. Ghoulish. So I mean, if, if it, if it flops, I mean, you're screwed with that. You have yeah. to like find somebody to, to change it, it into. Yeah. You have to change it into something else, like a rocket ship or something. If it fell, well, know. perpetual <laughs> motion machine publishing doesn't fit on my body. So. I know. <laughs> that, that's that's across your chest, above yeah, it's like above, thug, above thug, thug life. life, right above your belly button. It says, it says PMMP. Yeah, PMMP, PMMP. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> nice. Gulish yeah. is a great name for a press, like Tim said. Thank you, Tim. So, I, how, I ma- so. how many how uh, many books do you have lined up uh, for Gulish's first year? Here. Uh, eight books. We're going to do eight books a year. I have two other books through PMMP in addition to that that we're releasing. And those mm-hmm. haven't been talked about so much yet, which okay. then they include um, Moonfellows by Daniel Sladel. That is a book about the original moon landing that they don't want you to know about. And um, Like Real by Shelley Lyons, which is like a science fiction comedy about uh, fake limbs. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> that that's already making me laugh. It's about fake limbs. It's a comedy. Yeah, I don't know what the hell you what do you what do you call those? I think it begins with a P. Like, like you know, prosthetic. oh, I lost. That's it. Yeah, <laughs> I, yeah, that's the world. And, I, and you, for uh, for Ghoulish, you're actually doing a subscription, or you did? It's probably closed by now, but we did. Yeah, we did a subscription in the beginning of 2022. They paid like one upfront fee. And right. um, you that, and now we will deliver all eight of the ghoulish books, not the other two that will not ghoulish, just the ghoulish books right. throughout right. the year as they come out, along with a bunch of bonuses like uh, mugs and nice. uh, book milks and um, uh, physical laminated uh, ghoulish mental ship called. Which, if you, you show like a, it, 
at any physical event, we will give you a discount on the books we have. You had like a tote bag or something too, didn't you? You were printing up. Yep, tote bags as well. And um, I mean, it went pretty well. We sold mill copies, mill of those Mendel ships, and I thought we would. So I think um, next year we'll do the same. So if anyone is sad they missed out, uh, keep an eye out next January for so the 2023 batch. You, you, how, how many did you limit it to? 50, 30? We didn't limit it to anything. Oh, we yeah. just, we okay. just uh, it was a time limit. Like you have one month to I got subscribe you. I if got you, you want okay. it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you said you've been doing Perpetual Motion Machine for like 10 years or so. And you're what? You're like what? Twenty seven like or twenty eight, something like that. <laughs> twenty eight. Yeah, I'll be twenty nine so in July. So, starting out so young, did you like have a mentor to do that, or did you just kind of just dive into the deep end and start doing it on your own? Well, I don't do any of this. I don't do any of this alone. My my mm -hmm. partner, Lily Michelle, she's been with it since the beginning. So, okay. uh, two two of us doing this is uh, easier than just one of us doing right. it. And plus, we feel then both of us will helping edit a magazine called Dark Moon Digest, mm -hmm. which we would later go on to buy from the person who was running it because he, he grew disinterested in continuing it. But we still love the magazine, so we bought it from him. So we got like the roots of us being involved in any type of publishing came from helping with that magazine. And like he had a convention table at like Stokel Con in 20. 12 and also 2013 and we mm -hmm. drove up to those conventions and we helped with his table and we just got to know the community that way which led to us thinking you know maybe we should try this whole publishing thing and we did and for some reason we haven't stopped All right so i mean it, it's still working for you i know you uh was it on instagram or, or twitter you, you tweeted uh that you what cut yourself first check ever yeah uh, I mean, and, and I, I, I'm kind of glad you did that just to show people that, hey, it's not something that you're going to be making money out, off of right away. And, you know, don't go into thinking you're going to be rich right away and start making all kinds of money. So that's that shows real life that you are, you know, yeah, willing to let people know, hey, I've been doing this for 10 years now and I just now cut myself a first profit check. So, yeah, I think it's surprising for a lot of people who are not involved in like running a business. I mean, any mm -hmm. any money we made for the past 10 years, we just put directly back into the company to help with advertisements, to help yeah. with printing costs. It was like a pay. nonprofit organization almost. <laughs> it was pretty much that, yeah. And we decided, I mean, I quit my my job. I was doing the night shift at the hotel. I did that for eight years and I quit that um, when the movie was about to be filmed. And since then I've been writing and doing the publishing, just that's, that has been my job. I kind mm -hmm. of thought, well, you know, <laughs> if I, if I'm spending all day long working on this company, maybe we should be getting, getting paid for this because she was <laughs> also spending so much of your time <laughs> with the company and we've never gotten paid for it. So it was just like, a, Oh yeah, maybe we should now. And I'm <laughs> glad we did. <laughs> Finally, right? <laughs> so, yeah. Go ahead. I would say the magazine. Do you all still do the magazine? The Dark Moon Digest? We do. Yeah, it comes out, I think, three times every three months, whatever. I don't know how many months on a year. It comes out full times a year. So, you do that okay. kind of math. I can't do it. Quarterly. So, how do you have time to do anything? You write your own stuff. You have two publishing companies. You run a magazine. You wrote a script for a movie. <laughs> You have, uh, you have a dog Michelle. you have to take care of. <laughs> he's, he's napping right now, thankfully. He, um, Lily Michelle, I mean, she does all the magazine stuff, really. Okay. I help read Slush. I will edit some of the stories if I have time, but it's really, she's doing it. And every book that we publish, she she designs the inside. I edit the books. I read the Slush with the, the book Slush. And she does the inside designs. She does the bookkeeping, the accounting. I mean, it's, it's a two pills and show. I mean, I, right. I wouldn't yeah. be able to do any of this by myself. With the the slush piles you have, do you? Because I'll ask. We ask Laurel this, but they're doing like talk about their anthologies and stuff. Do you get like read a certain percentage of it before you decide yes or no if this is for me, or do you try to read the whole thing or like first two I, pages, fifty pages, or? I'm definitely quicker to reject. Than I am mm -hmm. to accept. Like I, I can I sometimes reject something based on one paragraph. It yeah. just depends on the quality of the writing. Right. I mean, there's so many different 
things it can depend on. But yeah, I don't have like a well, I have to give every silly these amount of pages. If yeah, I, I, not, it, I was gonna ask add to add on to that, like what are you looking for? What makes a book a PMMP book and what makes a book ghoulish and what makes you know a story that's something you're gonna continue with. So yeah, that's that's good insight for yeah, yeah, I, I've been asked that too. Like, well, what is it I'm looking for? And I don't know. Um, I mean, obviously, I want it to be uh, competently written. That would be a mm-hmm. plus. Otherwise, I'm not going to get invested into it. <laughs> Make um, consensus. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, voice is a big one. Uh, yeah. Like the the vibe I get from this really is is a huge plus for me. If I'm I mean, if you read a lot of the stuff we publish, it has a specific vibe to it, appeal mm-hmm. to other books. And if it's not the same, I, I don't know. It's basically just whatever I think is good. It's my own personal taste. And if it's, if I don't like it, then I'll. If I don't like something, why would I want to spend so much of my time trying to sell it onto others? Right, it would be yeah. like lying to someone, like. I want to promote something I am a fan of. Like I need mm-hmm. to be a fan of this book before I can publish this book. Yeah. It's sort of like we, how we do with reviews. Like if we don't care for the book and don't give it a great review, like I'm not going to keep pushing it like, Hey, you should go check this out. You should go check this out. Kind of thing. Like I don't want people to solely read or not read a book based on my opinion, but I want to give you yeah. my opinion and then you can make your own decisions. If you yeah, I usually, I usually not. tell people, it didn't work for me and why it didn't work for me, but things that don't work for me, it's going to work for somebody else. You know, I yeah. try to, I try to be nice, but sometimes I just don't even review it. If I don't, if I didn't like it. So. <laughs> and plus so, they'll, but, they'll sometimes I'll get a book I like, but I have no idea how to convince anyone else to read it. Like mm-hmm. non ghoulish is a ghoulish aside. Like with PMMP, a friend of mine recently sent me an essay, a collection of essays. It's pretty good, but I don't know what to do with it. I'm not the right company to do that. Like, yeah, yeah. I'm mostly the spooky guy. I do some like <laughs> science fiction and some like sometimes I'll do crime, although I don't know how to sell crime. I, I know how to spell. I know how to sell spooky stuff. Anything else I, I struggle with. I don't know that audience as well as I do the whole community. So I'm just not the right company to do that. Yeah. I mean, that's, that sounds more like, uh, like something clash books would do. Cause they're, they're like kind of, you know, wide they're, variety of, of, they're all over the place. Yeah. 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 Cool. So with a uh, ghoulish books and just the name ghoulish, is that something you're just drawn to? Because you have ghoulish books, and you have the ghoulish podcast. Is that just something you just like ghoulish? <laughs> I love the world. I mean, hell, I mean, I guess if someone builds to really ask me what uh, what type of fiction I'm looking to read and publish, I guess ghoulish is the right mm-hmm. build. It's the right description. It tells you what we'll publishing what we were interested in uh, ghoulish stuff and like when you at least with me when i think of the world ghoulish i don't think of something like something that is only like super serious and scaly i think of something that's kind of having fun with the genre that's having a good time ghoulish yeah. is like a it's like a it's a celebration of the genre and i just love it i mean it began with the podcast it just seemed like a good podcast name and i knew we would have i i didn't know then but Recently, you know, we had the idea to do the imprint, and it seemed like an obvious choice. And we also we were also doing a book fest in San Antonio at mm-hmm. the end of April called Ghoulish Book Fest, and it's just it's a great world because it's just one world, and it tells yeah. you everything you need to know. It does, and yeah. It, it plus, works. I have it tattooed now, so <laughs> it has to now, right? There's yeah. a there's a playfulness to the word too, like yeah. it's creepy, but it's kind of yeah. tongue in cheek, kind of playful too. Yeah. So. so how long's the podcast been going on? So I've done two podcasts. Before Ghoulish, I launched a podcast called Castle Rock Radio, and I right. did that I with uh, with my parent, and I did that with Lily. Uh, we were both the host, and it was basically every episode we would walk through the plot of something Stephen King had written and have fun with it. And we did that for like two, we launched it, I think, in 2016, maybe 2017. It lasted just over 100 episodes before we threw in the towel. Meanwhile, I launched the uh, Ghoulish, the podcast, I think in 2018, maybe 2019. I'm, I'm having trouble recalling now. Mm-hmm. And it was just because I wanted the freedom to do other things that interested me as far as podcasting goes, because they, 
the Castle Rock one was pretty uh, restrictive of what we talked about, Stephen right. King. Stephen King, and, yeah. <laughs> and that's pretty exhausting after a while. So I launched Ghoulish to see how that would go, and I, it was pretty fun. So I think it's been going on like three yields now, maybe. And it's well over 100 episodes, right? Yeah, Ghoulish is, I think, almost at 150. I, I am struggling to recall. I try to release an episode Monday and Friday, Okay. so twice a week. Uh, I don't always hit that, but no one's paying me to do it, so I don't feel too bad about <laughs> missing a couple days. So, I mean, is that just recorded audio only? There's no video with it, right? Um, I've only done video once with Ghoulish, and that was when I had Dan Rebuilt on the show. He did the practical effects of we need to do something. Okay. And I discovered well, he doesn't know what a podcast is. So when I opened, <laughs> when we opened the uh, Zoom call, uh, he had all these props from the movie. He was to kill the show. So it was like, well, I guess this is a video episode. Beyond that, uh, that's the only, beyond that, it's just audio. Yeah. Was it fun for the 100th episode getting all those different people to come on and do their little spiels? Oh, that was a lot of fun. And, pretty exhausting the, the edit you had a lot I, of people on that episode i yeah I, they um basically for those listening who don't know i i i emailed a bunch of uh previous guests of the podcast i told them in the show i died i was assassinated <laughs> and they will to recall a brief uh, uh audio recording of them telling the audience full sympathy is for my death so i got <laughs> i think like fucking 70 tracks emailed to me through like over two months and i pieced them together for like this montage of people mostly just talking shit about me they were they were all talking shit on you. is this the one with uh with john lovitz too or yeah yeah john okay. lovitz. <laughs> <laughs> i i uh i got like, i was pretty drunk driving <laughs> well i wasn't driving uh i was in the passenger seat pretty drunk and i was halfway through done editing that podcast when it, i thought man it would be hilarious <laughs> if i got john levis to say that i don't know why john levis specifically <laughs> oh, no that's came. so odd <laughs> so i looked on a cameo and i googled i searched that for john levis to see if he had one and of course he did he's john levis he's <laughs> yeah, not doing anything what else, else. Is going to do yeah <laughs> and uh while uh intoxicated i uh i paid him a uh, 150 bucks <laughs> do a cameo saying that I was killed by a poison egg and I, I don't <laughs> regret it whatsoever. When uh, when are we invited onto <laughs> that episode would get like zero views. Know, cut, that, like, cut that, cut that, cut that. Like, totally shut it down. Okay. <laughs> Tim wants to know if you have a dream guest you'd like for your for ghoulish. Tony Hawk. That'd be cool. Yeah, I want to talk to him about a uh, spooky skate building. Yeah. Do, do you limit it to just horror stuff, or have you gone outside horror stuff before, even though it's called ghoulish? Um, I try to make it somehow related to spookiness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, so if Tony Hawk will come on, we wouldn't just talk about skateboarding. We would yeah. talk about spooky skateboarding. <laughs> um, and stay tuned. Time. That might happen. I, it might happen. I, I've put a, I am. I have a badge for South by Southwest this year, and there's a fucking Tony Hawk uh, documentary <laughs> going on, and I have a press badge. So I nice. was emailed by the documentary people, like Tony Hawk is available for interviews. So I put in a request <laughs> saying I would love to talk to Tony Hawk nice. about this documentary. I have no plans of talking to him <laughs> about this documentary. We're talking about spooky skate building, which he knows what that means. I'm going to I'm going to get the secrets out of him if he agrees. He probably won't agree, but maybe. <laughs> but look, dude, I've got a movie. I'm important. <laughs> so you have this uh this convention, Brad, you wanted to talk about the convention, right? It's coming up. Yeah, Ghoulish Book Con. What is it called? Uh Ghoulish Book Fest. Yeah. Book Fest. And that's in, in, uh, San Antonio, in April. End of April, beginning of May, that last weekend, that kind of transitions from April into May. It's downtown mm -hmm. San Antonio. We have like 17 different uh, vendor tables. We'll have panels, fun readings. Um, Little Hightail, Cynthia Paleo, guests of Arnold, they will coming down to visit and do some cool stuff. Nice. Can you say who, uh, any publishers, anything that are going to be there, or you want to keep that secret? Hi. Can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I can't. I think 
Well, I Ghoulish think, Books um, will be there, and Perpetual Ghoulish Motion Books Machine will be, will be there. Bill. Yeah, I, I know we're going to be making some announcements of all the, the tables, the vendor mm-hmm. spots in the future. I just, yeah, I'm blanking. It's mostly, like, not as much, like, presses, but, like, uh, writers who are just going to come and sell the books they've written. So okay. I'm blanking on names at the moment. Was that this whole convention thing? Because I know I remember you talked about it not too long ago, like, thinking about wanting to do it. Is this coming together pretty quick? No, it's um I, I regret doing it. <laughs> <laughs> it's too stressful. I uh I, I don't like it. <laughs> so this is the one and done. <laughs> Are you excited I mean, for it though? No. No. <laughs> you're you're um, dreading the days. <laughs> but it, I think it'd be legit too. It's like <laughs> it might be I mean it'll, it'll it will hopefully be good. Mm-hmm. I won't know and I won't feel good about it until after the weekend. Because until then, I will just, I'm just going to be stressed that it's somehow going to be like a disaster. And there's no way I'm not going to feel that way until after it's done. Yeah. It's just how I operate. So be like that, ask uh, me concert, again or, in May. It's be like that concert that Ja Rule did that no one, like they didn't have any food. They got stranded, all that stuff. What is that? What was that called? Fire, like fire something. Yeah. yeah I, I, t- I tweeted like two days ago. Many people oh, did you? say <laughs> Ghoulish Book Fest will be the new file Fest. Will they be wrong? Time will tell. <laughs> it sounds cool though because you've got like three different levels. Uh-huh. And you got what the vendors on the bottom and there's like panels and stuff on the next levels up. Yeah. And, and the live readings. And the way I'm doing it is on the, um, if you want to see like the panels and participate in readings, you need to buy a badge. But mm-hmm. if you just want to go and browse the bookshop that we have going on with the tables, that's free to the public. So anyone can come in and check it out, which I think any book festival should do. They should always let the book, the book room be free to the public because they really uh, lose out on potential uh, reloads that yeah. way. Cause they can spend that money buying those books instead of just getting exactly. in the door. Exactly. Yep. So have you been promoting that locally a lot to get local people to come? We all about to, yeah. We didn't want to mm-hmm. do it too early, but yeah, I'm excited yeah. because we do a bunch of local fests uh, in San Antonio. Like we have tables at them, but we don't run them. But we're friends with the people who do run them, so they've mm-hmm. given us a lot of advice and like uh, a long list of places that will allow you to leave promo like that at the uh, establishment. So we are going to be printing up like 15,000 flying olds and going all around town nice. and doing that. And um, I sometimes write for the local newspaper, the, like the, not the newspaper, but like the alternative zine zine. And um, mm-hmm. so I know they will help promote it as well. So it's going to be a lot of promotion in the coming two, two months. Fuck. <laughs> My God. <laughs> That's we cool. just raised it's, his anxiety it, by talking about it. So. And San Antonio, <laughs> that's a good, back. that's a good big area too. So it's not like you're in like where I'm at, like twenty thousand people live here. So like five people would show up. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so are you, do you have like any clue about how many people might be coming or anything? Like by passes you've sold um, already or anything? Like you don't have to sold, tell us numbers, but you sold a yeah decent amount. We've sold. I mean, we've sold like seventeen tables. That's uh, cool. Like twenty or thirty uh, badges we've sold. I'm hoping the majority of the people who show up will just random people on the street who see a like a an ad on Facebook mm-hmm. or in the newspaper and they just show up to check out some books. I mean, seventeen vendor tables for a first time event. I think that's pretty good. Right. Yeah, we sold we sold out. I mean, because I had I have a few people who were volunteering to help, like if I need anything. So in return, I just gave them a table for free. So they could mm-hmm. sell stuff. So once we hit 17, I just had to kind of like say, oh, we'll sold out because right. I lost track of how many free tables I uh, volunteered. <laughs> so in reality, I think we had like 20, maybe 22 tables, but we sold okay. 17 of them. And 30 badges. So far. I mean, you still got time to get. Yeah. Know, it's going to be successful. No worries. No worries. Let's talk about <laughs> breathe, it. Breathe. Breathe, Max. <laughs> breathe. Okay. I, the next thing we have see... to show is how to breathe. We're going to meditate a little bit. <laughs> I can see it being a, a yearly thing if that's yeah. something you wanted to do. I think you'll I think you'll do good with it. I'll I'll, I'll tell you what's going to happen. I'll spend the whole weekend <laughs> bitching and complaining, stressed out, saying, well, not doing this again. And then Monday after, I'll say, okay, what are we going to do next time? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> It's gotta be it's even gonna bigger. Happen. It'll be four floors next year. <laughs> let's build. Let's 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 add one to this building. This so old. You're gonna, have, 
<laughs> build you gotta build the build the set of your movie and just have it like a be a centerpiece where people can go sit up there and take pictures and stuff. There you go. Yeah. Make it a, a rage room. Do you guys know about rage rooms? Yeah. You, yeah, I found out recently. I, I think it's pretty cool. I want to do one. What you need to do is an escape room with the bathroom from we need to do something and really I, lock I, them in there. Yeah. I suggested that out. to uh I suggested that exact thing as a marketing tactic and uh, no one responded to my email. Oh. <laughs> That's actually, I think that's a really. I'm, I'm not, starting to like get a theme here that nobody responds to. People email. don't respond to Max. <laughs> yeah. No, they don't like me. Yeah. Well, how good of an idea that people do those escape rooms all the time, and this is the battle wow. room you're stuck in. Like that's. I know. Perfect. It but, makes but, so much sense to me. As fast as we need to do something was made by next year, when he's ready for the next one, you'll have two other movies ready to go. So, it'll be take <laughs> take your pick. Fucking doubt it. I don't see that happening. <laughs> So uh, I mean, I, I'll, I'll tell you something that might shed some light on what IFC thinks of me. Um, I, <laughs> they must have uh, listened to the audio uh, commentary we did by now. And in that commentary, I did imply that um, IFC stands for uh, I Fuck Children. And, <laughs> and I did also um, advertise that they had a, if you went to Film Hub, and try to get a premium membership. If you enter discount code IFC Films, you would get a discount code. So I mean, I'm not shocked they don't answer my emails now. <laughs> nice. Uh, somebody's gonna yeah. watch this. Somebody's gonna watch this video like in three months and actually try that now. <laughs> I mean, I haven't tried. It. I don't know. The coupon it code it's expired by now. I know. Shoot. <laughs> it has expired. to. They need to re-update that. <laughs> I was gonna so, ask you something now, and now I forgot because you you talking about Pornhub. <laughs> yeah, way to go! I Not was just going to hop in this. I was just going to hop into some writing here before we end everything. I was I was just curious: is is there a particular piece that you've written that you're most proud of, and is there one that you just don't talk too much about? <laughs> I know which one he doesn't talk about. <laughs> Uh, probably Maggot Screaming. I'm pretty proud of. Um, sometimes when you write a book, you you try to hit a certain type of thing and you don't always succeed. But Maggot Screaming came out pretty much exactly how I wanted it to come out. It hit it has the right mix of comedy, has the right mix of oh no, someday I'm gonna die. <laughs> <laughs> um, I love it. Yeah, I'm, I'm I'm pretty happy with how the book came out. I'm, I'm not always happy, but that one, yeah. And the book I'm not going to talk about is uh, <laughs> um, um, called Needful Sleepal Activities. So uh, <laughs> that has less to do with the uh, quality of the book and more to do with the uh, the company that has the book rights to it. Oh, yeah. okay. Got screwed on that one, didn't you? Possibly. <laughs> I don't know. It's difficult to say when uh, – the person you're talking about has a team of royals and uh, you know, he needs a pussy. So go on. <laughs> oh, there was something I was going to ask you and I probably just forgot again, but you don't like to sell your books through Amazon, like through ghoulish books. I'm guessing perpetual motion machine. They're not on Amazon. So what, are, how do you go? They are available on Amazon. I don't really? actively really? promote them. Okay. I don't I actively know. direct uh, customers to Amazon, but they are available because I don't think it's quite um, – I don't think it's filled to the, the writers I publish to not make it available, Bill, because that's the okay. that's the best way that readers discover new books, yeah. sadly. But, yeah, I don't – I'm not an active uh, participator in that company, and I tend to direct people to – the website ghoulishbooks.com and we sell books directly through the website and you know everyone gets more money that way and also you'll not support a company that uh, <laughs> lets the employees piss in bottles and die in tornadoes so, you know. yeah exactly and, and the thing about that is like i mean you, you kind of have to have it on amazon because people the way people have their amazon set up you know it's mm -hmm. a lot of one click yeah. whereas if they go to your if they go to your uh, company's website you know they got to to fill out everything, get their card out, and, and you know, yeah. I, I hate to say people are lazy, but you know, the one-click thing on Amazon. I I would go to your website to get it because I mean I'm a supporter of Indian Small Press, but like I could just see that person having the one-click thing set up and just automatically yeah. click it and, and then it, plus you know. Amazon speedy delivery has right. uh, spoiled people quite a bit. Yeah, yeah, which I have discovered from uh, Phil's experience. Feel like we've been like 
two days late mailing something and we get angry emails it's like Do you Whoa. Really? Whoa. oh yeah it's like oh hold on this is a two pills in operation in a, right. in a kitchen in a kitchen calm down <laughs> <laughs> so that's why we added a uh it's like a little pop-up on the bottom of the website that advertises anything uh, you buy will be mailed yeah. out on the next Friday. So we yeah. just have designated Fridays to uh, mail stuff out on post mm -hmm. office trips. Yeah. And also, I mean, I'll, I'll say this as we're talking about this um, on the web on the website, um, we do allow people to make like accounts, obviously, but also we've. Uh, instituted a uh, like a point system so the mill things you buy from that website you collect points and you can use those points to get a discount on Ethel books okay that's cool cool yeah 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 so you, it has the advantages of still going through your website and doing it direct nice yeah nice i mean and you know one of the other things that you know, i'm not an advocate for for amazon but it's a place to have a review you know, mm -hmm. and if someone's floating through there, they just happen to see a review. And I am so bad about putting reviews on Amazon. Like I forget because I read cool. so many, uh, you know, arcs now. So does Brad. I forget the release day to go over there and put them up. Yeah. <laughs> so it's well, like half good the, reads. Yeah. Half the time I put a review on there, they reject it anyway. They they don't right. tell you why. It's just like just well, convoluted. I mean, you best our community guidelines up. Figure it out yourself. Yeah. You have you sounded a bit too pro union. Delete. <laughs> It's like you can't... usually it's, usually it's mine mine says uh, stuff like you know it just felt like a kick to the balls you can't use yeah. balls on Amazon you can on Goodreads <laughs> but you can't say yeah. balls on Amazon what you, just... can say, you can say fuck on Goodreads but you can't say fuck on Amazon so yeah, well, like Amazon fact, will have Amazon owns Goodreads so it's like what are you talking yeah. about <laughs> but it's funny like on Amazon you can go buy like a neon sign that spells out the word fuck mm -hmm. but you can't. Yeah use the word in the review to describe the same like it doesn't make any sense well it's like do you guys know uh brian aspen he just released yeah, a his book, book called man, man Fuck fuck house. house yeah how do you even review that book on amazon without getting like banned which it doesn't uh, yeah. make any sense like that amazon can have that title out there yeah but someone talking about that book couldn't say the name of the book in their own review for that book right yeah. I mean, and if somebody doesn't like it, I mean, the review would be like, "Man, fuck this book." <laughs> but I mean, I haven't read. It. I have it for Kindle Unlimited, but I, I mean, I haven't read it yet. So I just it's a good book. Just, yeah, just I mean, your, your reviews got to have the fuck in it. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. And Amazon's like that evil that a lot of Indian small press people they have to do because a lot of them don't have websites. They don't have you know other ways to promote it, and they're more likely That's people true. are going to run across it on Amazon than maybe scrolling through it and find it on Twitter and stuff. Right. Yeah. Speaking of uh, reviews, do bad reviews matter to you? Or do you no. read your reviews on your books? Do you really even care? When we when we do our videos for Maggot Screaming, are you going to care? <laughs> I'm gonna watch. I'm gonna watch it many times, probably. On ten hour loop. <laughs> yeah. Something I hate about myself is I I'm a, obsessed with uh, anything about me. I, my ego is just embarrassing. <laughs> so I do read every review and I do not want to, but I do anyway. Yeah. Over and over and over. And I don't like it, but they don't affect me that much. I do laugh sometimes when I see like a, oh, this bathroom is not open. Bathrooms are not open outside, <laughs> which is funny to me, but I don't, I don't get offended or mad. Yeah. And good reviews do nothing for me at all. So I don't know. It's like a masochistic <laughs> thing Well, I just... I have to read them. I don't like it, but I do. Without giving, trying not to give you the way, there's a something meta in Maggot Screaming where you sort of yeah. were poking fun at yourself, which oh, yeah, you yeah, could yeah. tell you have a good sense of humor and can take things like that and not take it too seriously. Yeah, they uh, they talk about watching We Need to Do Something and <laughs> yeah. Maggot Screaming. And uh, it's funny because in We Need to Do Something, the book, they talk about watching a TV adaptation of my book, The Nightly Disease, I don't know why I always do that. But I just add like <laughs> Ethel things I've written have been made in the movies and TV shows. And it's those your own universe. Watch it. I guess, but it's like a fucking nesting doll, right? <laughs> yeah, it is. Like going, going in. I do have something kind of cool. I have to get up. To sh I'll, I'll be right back to show Wait, you oh, yeah. A, yeah. a prop from the movie. Okay. So he wore pants. He followed the dress code. <laughs> pants are optional. Oh, shit. Pants are optional. <laughs> Okay, I thought I closed out of a browser. <laughs> so in the in the movie, they play, they bring in a sack of build games, right? And mm -hmm. yeah. in the script, I had listed all types of different games that we couldn't use in the movie because of copyright reasons. 
so they gave me the option to uh, create my own game. And I, so I did. I came up with a game. And I told them what it would look like and what the rules would be. And then they made it. They didn't make the inside of the game, but they made the case. Oh, and okay. as we were in pre-production doing all this, I, as I said, I had just quit my, my job, which I hated so fucking much. And that was yeah, I remember you complain on Twitter about that all the time. <laughs> oh, yeah. And so I, I came up with a game called The Great Hotel Escape. And then they <laughs> made it. <laughs> That's nice. Cool. And briefly you can that see it legit. in the movie yeah oh yeah and i'll show off some of the side i mean so obviously is the they let me have it which is nice that needs to be something that appears in a book now yeah, yeah. Really pleased. I wish they had made the actual game because I spent a long time coming up with the rules and everything. And they were like, oh, we just need the design of the case. <laughs> Thanks for doing all this, but we just need this one little part here. <laughs> and those one there's like one segment in the movie where the boy is like, Can we play the great hotel escape? And then you never will see it again. No one plays it. That's okay. You need to do a do a Kickstarter to get that game going. That'd be sweet. <laughs> do you think I, I don't know if I even own the rights to this game now? They might have to fucking take it from me. <laughs> God damn it. Just change, change it to the, the yeah. great motel escape. And just there you go. It. It, it, it's the uh the trousy version. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we'll do a motel instead. Yeah. Do you know anything about the Brandon Sanderson Kickstarter? Did you see anything about that? Yeah, I was just reading the comment. I was catching up. That's crazy. He, last time I saw, he was at like 15 million. What the hell is he at now? I, I didn't. Re- I saw a headline, but I didn't read anything. So not I think a Sanderson. In 24 time. hours, he did 15 million, and I wow. checked the next day, and he was up to almost 20 already. Jesus Christ! I'm not a huge fantasy guy, so I didn't mm-hmm. know who he was. So it, once someone like kind of told me and all about who he was, it made no sense because. I thought he was just like this nobody who just somehow began raising all this money. <laughs> but they will, someone told me like, no, he's like the Stephen King of the fantasy genre. Right. Yeah. So, so what's he, is he? Is he trying to raise money for his, another book or something? Or he wrote four secret books in t- the last two years. That because he's like super like, um, oh, I can't think of words, but like he has like this spreadsheet on his website, and he has all these different books he's writing, and he updates like the progress like every day, like. Wrote the three words in this book. Yeah, he's very prolific. So he he's writing like probably ten books right now, and he wrote four secret books. And you know they're like this thick. Yeah. Okay. I mean, so I, the, I don't. The, care the Kickstarter's for anything, to, so. for those four books to come out in twenty twenty three. So you get like one every quarter. Is that what you read? You read Sanderson, uh, yeah, right? Uh, whatever it's called, the Way of Kings thing. Your your bet you have with Leslie. Bet with Leslie. Yeah. Yeah, that was Sanderson. I I don't know anything about him besides. What he, he did so <laughs> he wrote the last two or three books of the Wheel of Time series after what's his name? Uh, Robert Jordan died. Yeah, the big the show that's on Amazon now, The Wheel of Time. He wrote oh, the last I few of those books. Watched it, but... I haven't either, I, but I haven't read a lot of fantasy. Although I was having this conversation like two days ago with some friends, and some of them do read fantasy and they were the ones explaining who he was, and that mm-hmm. led to them like basically a cyber bullying me into tracking down um these uh these books by gene wolf uh the book of the new sun you know about that i haven't heard of that it's oh shit okay <laughs> shit. i thought you were this fantasy guy excuse me <laughs> i do fantasy but i haven't heard i i don't, I don't do fantasy I mean, my fantasy I, Stephen I King fantasy, a horror a lot. baby yeah i yeah. bark a fantasy but that's about it so well i didn't know him either but i'm also not a fantasy guy yeah. like you brad um, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I don't know they sound pretty good i'm gonna have to track them down that's all I have to say about that, I guess. <laughs> as, as far as like a Kickstarter, like he's doing for books, would you ever consider doing anything like that for a book or something with ghoulish or anything? Or have a new imprint like, for fantasy? <laughs> like if it was, it doesn't have to be no. fantasy, but like just something like a big project. <laughs> would you ever consider doing like a Kickstarter kind of thing? I mean, I could see like may, possibly next year doing the ghoulish membership subscription as a Kickstarter. Mm-hmm. That could okay. be a good thing to do because it's it's basically what we did, but we didn't have a Kickstarter. We mm-hmm. we had like you know the infographic advertising what it was and all these these fun bonuses you would get if you bought it. Mm-hmm. I mean, I imagine it probably would have been more successful as a Kickstarter. It's because you know you have like if it had gotten picked up as a project we love, it could have yeah. been spread to who knows. And but I don't regret not doing it this time because it's more like. 
I guess this shield is it's a way to demonstrate to people what this is even going to be and maybe get some folks uh, envious for not jumping on build. So next year, right. they will be uh, excited to secure that mineral ship the moment we announce it. And maybe that will be a good time to do it as a Kickstarter. I don't know. I'm not opposed to it. It could be something. Because I, I saw a lot of people when he raised so much money so quick, about how it could change publishing. Like he's this big, huge author. He's yeah. sort of kicking the publishers to the curb, and he's doing it all himself through the Kickstarter. It's like, what so if he, like so he, he's doing these sell? I mean, he, these are be I'm sure he, he's got this big, huge team behind him. But yeah, okay. yeah, and that's why he's raising all the money. He his goal was a million dollars, and he's you know thousand percent over that already. But people were talking about like, what if you know James Patterson and Stephen King and they went Kickstarter route and instead of going publisher route, like what would that do to the big four, big five, however many it is now? I, it's a good question. Uh, I don't know. Like, would it just crush them? Like, uh, I, I think Cena Paleo said that probably in contract soon will say, like, you can't have these, like, outside uh, sources to collect money and stuff, like, sort of going to kick, Kickstarter as part of their contract so they don't do that. Well, I know some, like, big presses, they do have that already. Like, you can't publish another book that we will not publish in within this amount of time. Like, that's mm-hmm. a... That's why you see someone like, say, Josh Mandelman come out with so many limited edition books because right. he has all these books, but he can't release them all and break contracts or anything. But you can do a limited edition. Yeah. So I know like uh, Flame Street Press specifically, you see them with the same authors like Jonathan Jans and Hunter Shea, like yeah. and Glenn Rolfe. I think they get like multi-book deals like or they at least get uh, first dibs on if they want to publish that book or not before it could go yeah. to somebody else. Yeah, I, I think just thought uh, that was, that was a curious, yeah. it was an interesting thing to think about, like authors going out on their own, big authors like that, to do it all on their own kind of thing. It is, yeah. I, I'm I'm excited to see where this goes. I mean, I would like all that money that he raised. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It would be nice. I, I think it's already the highest grossing Kickstarter, or whatever you want to word it. It's kind of cool that it's a book project that raised yeah. that much too. Like the highest you would think would be like a movie or something, but no, it's a book. That's pretty cool. Yeah. You wouldn't uh, think the, it would be a book. In twenty twenty two, it's a book, not not any kind of TV show or movie or you yeah. know action adventure movie or anything like that, which is pretty cool. The previous yeah. one was some kind of watch, like some kind of digital watch, <laughs> which was kind of weird. It was like it raised twenty million dollars. <laughs> Why? I just, was, I don't was know. Apple? <laughs> no, it wasn't so, Apple. I, I mean, it Apple looked bit. like an Apple Watch, but I, didn't, I don't know. It's some brand I never heard of. But yeah, within 24 hours, 48 hours, he'd already broken that record for books, which wow. is cool. He still has, he still has like 27 days left. <laughs> what do you think he's gonna hit? I think it'll slow down. I, I, I bet he'll get about 30 million. That sounds about right. Yeah. yeah. Um, speaking of Kickstarter. I'm going to plug a, a thing my, my buddy's doing. I'm not involved yeah, in it. He, my buddy, Zach Chapman, he's doing a comic book series called House of Blood. Ooh. And he has like, I think maybe 10 days left in the Kickstarter. They they raised like his goal within like eight hours of launching. And it's like at 6,000 now, I think. But it's a great, like if you like old school, like EC Hill comics, like Tales from the Crypts, right. it's something mm-hmm. like that. But like, well, nowadays it's really fun i got to read it ahead of time and i loved it so if anyone's a fan of those types of comics go to kickstarter type in house of blood volume one you get i think it's like five issues cool that sounds cool i like uh tales of the crypt and stuff yeah wasn't there a recent uh kickstarter was it for mm. off limits were they doing something or yeah they did two did i they? think yeah i think i i think i donated to both of them but i can't thinking what they will call them now like i i i didn't i i'm not on twitter as much as brad is over there because i yeah. think twitter's evil but um it is evil. <laughs> I, I think i i saw a couple i missed so much i mean I, I get my mind blows when i when i get on there sometimes and i miss so much but i thought i saw something from them about a kickstarter yeah, yeah i think they had one film anthology and one film right. anthology of non-fiction both of them okay I think about Sapphic also. That's what it was. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. what it was. Yeah, I can't think of the title now. But I, I can't you, either. But it's, it's, you it's that, probably on their Twitter or their website yeah. or something. So yeah, yeah, fun stuff. You could do a Kickstarter if, if you have any uh, like uh, stories that you started 
in the past that you gave up on you never finished that could be a kickstarter to uh, get get your old stories out there <laughs> our rewards here I'll, yeah if you give me this much money, I'll finish chapter two <laughs> if we get this much then, then I'll, I'll finish I'll, chapter three yeah. i'll release I'll, this story i wrote when i was 13 years old <laughs> i'll finish this fucking book finally <laughs> yeah this thousand page mega novel i've been working on so yeah i'll so, use so, that money to go to new mexico and finish the <laughs> My atomic bomb book I've been trying to write for like five years. Well, there you go. <laughs> are you um, really writing an atomic bomb book? Or you just, yeah. Okay. Nice. That, I want to go to uh, Los Alamos and uh, like spend like a week researching the Enola yeah, because that's when that's where the book takes place. But it turns out vacationing like, is, is that expensive. I didn't know that. <laughs> so that's is that going to be? Is that horror related? Would that be a good book? I don't or is fucking. It different? I don't you know? fucking know what it would be. It, it's like a, I feel like pretentious saying this, but it's going to be super long and like the same weight as something like Gravity's Rainbow, okay. like that type of complicated, <laughs> dumb book that no one wants to read. <laughs> but that's what it's going to end up being. So it's taking me a while. I'm like, I think I've written like fucking 25,000 builds of it and it's still in the opening scene so i'm just annoyed <laughs> by how long it's going to end up being so you said you've been working on that one for like five years or so Twenty-five thousand words for the opening scene <laughs> since nice. you since you started into the publishing game really young have you been writing for since you're pretty young yeah definitely just since i was just a kid yeah just something mm -hmm. i always did do you have and any plus, other go ahead go ahead no go ahead I was just going to say some shit, so go ahead. <laughs> no, you go ahead. Finish your thought. Um, when I was a teenager, I, we moved into a hotel, and I was withdrawn from school. Mm -hmm. And so for several years, I just stayed in a hotel room, and I did nothing but write and write and write. So I think like that type of childhood helped me like dedicate myself to the craft. Do you have any other, since you have been writing for so long, do you have any other ideas that you've had sort of simmering for a while that you'd like to eventually get out there? Sort of like the, the atomic bomb test book. The atomic bomb one. Yeah. And I'm doing it, but I think it's going to be a novella right now. That is something I've been meaning to write for like over a decade now, which is about my time living in a hotel. So mm -hmm. I, I've always wanted to write that and I didn't know how to until pretty recently. So I'm excited to get that one done once and for all. Is that what you're looking to publish yourself or try to send it to somebody else? I don't know yet. I haven't decided. I I did maggot screaming myself because I do not see any <laughs> any agent or mainstream press uh, wanting to finish that book or do be involved in it in it at all i just i could i could like see into the future of me sending <laughs> this book to agents and it didn't seem like a bright future so it just made more sense <laughs> to release that one myself it's really anti-commercial it's so good though it's so funny like it i think is, people yeah. are whoever you is not you know wanting to pick it up they, they missed out on that yeah like, like i was actually like I've talked to Brad behind the scenes. I was getting a little burnout from, I mean, no offense to anything I've been reading or anybody I've been reviewing lately, but like it was, it was a fresh slap in the face basically because of the humor and, and just the, mm -hmm. the, the structure of it and the way it was just these conversations were just going on and on and on. And I just got a kick out of it. So it was, it was like, you know, fresh breath because, you know, and it helped with the burnout I was doing with all of these reviews I was doing. So. <laughs> Fuck all those simple books. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, pu and Publishers Weekly or whatever the hell that yeah. is. Yeah. Like your so. your dialogue feels so natural. Like, yeah. is that something you sort of pride yourself on is your dialogue in books? Because it felt like a lot of times you it felt Well, he's recording stagnant. this. This is all going to be in a, this whole oh, yeah. dialogue. <laughs> like a lot of times dialogue can feel very stiff and stagnant, but yours right. felt extremely natural. Like what people would actually say in those situations and like the humor back and forth. Is that something you sort of pride yourself on? Your your dialogue. I love writing dialogue more than anything. So yeah, mm -hmm. I have a lot of fun with dialogue, especially in a book like Maggot Screaming. Well, it mostly takes place in one room. I mean, not one mm -hmm. room, but one setting, the house. And later yeah. on, they get, they leave, but mostly it's just the one setting. And 
so you have lots of room just to have these odd, unhinged uh, conversations, yeah. and there's no stopping the conversation because no one's leaving. So you just have to yeah. see <laughs> will they yeah. go, and sometimes it gets awkward and uncomfortable, and I love that. Sometimes, sometimes they can't leave because they're, you know, yeah. fucking stuck dead. Or, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or they're dead. Yeah, <laughs> and, and, and the the fight over the, uh, the eye drops, the try the eyes. Just, just my eyes were thing. itching. Yeah, my eyes were drying out reading that whole part, by the way. Let me ask you guys something since you read this, and I haven't talked to a lot of people who have read the book yet. Would you classify this as a zombie book? I, I thought don't... that about three quarters of the way in, but I was I was like, I, I don't know. I don't know. think so, because I feel okay. like there's something else going on. Yeah. Which is still a mystery, but I don't I feel like it's not zombies because they're not trying to like eat brains and they're not they're not dumb. Like, yeah, like, I can't decide. Alienistic zombies, because I mean, it's like look at Andy's dialogue, you know, and he's thinking aliens, and it's just like, yeah. or or it's a curse or something yeah. more like that. I mean, I, I don't want to say too much because again, I don't want to spoil or anything. But let's still. talk about the ending right now. Oh, you want to? Okay, let's just, let's just, just put it all out there. I would say, I would for me, I would say it's not a zombie book. Yeah, okay. I don't know. No, I don't think it is. I, I think it's okay. uh weird phenomena kind of some sort of yeah like without saying anything like it's still mysterious about yeah. kind of what all is going on and they even mentioned that in the book like it doesn't matter what the like genesis of it was yeah do you have an idea yourself of what caused everything to happen or is that just something you nope. just kind of left mysterious i left it mysterious i do that sometimes with a lot of my books like say we need to do something and I don't exactly explain what's going on outside right, you saw the bathroom. The, you saw what TikTok he did about that. Where he, yeah. Yeah. Was when, he, when he gave, when he gave was... away the indeed. <laughs> yeah. I don't like <laughs> explaining things. I don't think it's exciting. And I think a lot of times with a book or a movie, once you do have that explanation, it's just It takes some of the, the mysticism yeah. of it away. Yeah. yeah. So – Never explain anything is my, my best <laughs> I, mean, I, I, I like that kind of ending where it, it, you don't have to go in and tie up every loose end. You know, you yeah. leave, to me, I mean, I, I compare a lot of stuff like that to songs and song lyrics because it, it's like kind of open for interpretation. What you feel like the ending might have been is the same as like a, a, a certain song. Your interpretation of what it means may be something totally different than somebody else. So I mean, yeah. when you have like an open ending like that to to a story, and not every not every thing is tied up. You know, you could be like, oh, I bet you it was about this and this, and somebody else is going to say, no, it's probably this and this. So I mean, that right. just opens up a conversation about it. You know, you're not you're I, not uh, pigeonholing the audience into thinking it's this one thing. They can sort of think whatever they want to. Right. I love seeing what people come up with, like with the movie. Someone, <laughs> I think it was on. I did a Reddit AMA in a someone commented who has seen the movie like they were asking me if the rattlesnake in the movie was a metaphor for like fake news i was like what the fuck are you talking about <laughs> i just thought it was the, the witchcraft stuff going on. i mean i thought it was just you know i didn't know fake news <laughs> in reality i just i find rattlesnakes scaly yeah and it's supposed to be in texas <laughs> all snakes. rattlesnakes right all snakes. yeah even though the movie doesn't fucking take place in texas <laughs> it's like all snakes i, I don't snakes why does that have to be yeah. snakes? yeah so there's yeah i was gonna well, i was watching this before we started i didn't finish it but there's a, a video on youtube it's got like thirteen thousand views or so called we need to do something the ending is explained and he i guess yeah. he's trying to explain the ending. have you watched that oh yeah it's got oh, yeah. thirteen thousand views really it's got yeah. it's got a decent amount like is that guy was he close at all to what i i'll say after i watched that video i thought man I'm a fucking genius. <laughs> like, I wish I would have thought of that. <laughs> yeah, like, wow, I didn't know I was so smelt. <laughs> he should have wrote it, though. That guy, that guy I, should be writing the movie. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> I only watched, like, the first couple minutes. He's talking about how all the it was all the symbolism and stuff. And so I was just curious yeah. if, like, he was hitting the nail on the head or if he's just, like, not even close to what you thought. I think the best books, and I guess movies as well, but I have no experience with watching and reading books. Watching mm -hmm. books, fuck me. Writing and <laughs> reading books. Um, We're good. It's think, getting late. We know it. <laughs> I think the best ones are written by people who are not going in intending on adding a message or intending on writing a specific theme. 
that mm -hmm. stuff kind of plays in the subconscious, right? And whatever the writer is feeling at the time, even if, even if they don't like directly thinking about it, that's going to feed into the book they write. But if they go in thinking, okay, I'm going to write a, a book about, you know, dysfunctional families. I'm going to write this book about like loneliness. It's not going to come off. It's going to come off like a fucking cheesy uh, PSA, you know, you see at, at school. It's going to feel really heavy handed, like, yeah very obvious that this is what they're trying to sort of hammer in yeah yeah so yeah so the summer to uh explain uh, i didn't think about anything when writing the book i just i just thought it'd be fun <laughs> to write a book about a family in a fucking bathroom and to see yeah. what would happen and anything else is just whatever i was feeling like inside of me that i didn't even know about mm -hmm. and like i was like double-edged like i wanted to know what was outside and have it explained but the other side i like i like not knowing and then me thinking at myself like okay what do i think is out there because there's yeah. multiple different things like you know could it be witchcraft there's a guy there something's getting shot it sounds like there's maybe a big monster out there you really don't know and it could be whatever you want it to be they um the people who financed the movie they wanted me to write an extra scene that they could film of mm -hmm. them going outside the bathroom and seeing what everything looks like so this is to address like some reviews we've gotten. Well, it's like, oh, they obviously didn't have the budget to film a scene outside the bathroom. <laughs> they did, and they wanted it to be filmed. But I was really uh, strict. I'm saying, nope, no fucking way. Not writing that scene. Doesn't need to be filmed. And they were yeah. like, well, let's just have it just in case down the line. And I, I know what that means. That means we're going to use it. So I, I did yeah. not write that scene. <laughs> I did not want to show it was outside the bathroom. It had nothing to do with the budget because if you read the book, you also don't see what's outside the bathroom in the book. Mm -hmm. And then again, that can skew the audience completely one way or the other way about what's going on. Yeah. Showing that one extra scene. Yeah, I think so. Like I love the movie, uh, Clovel field. Uh, yeah. Well, what the fuck is that movie called? Not Clovel field, but that sequel with the, the underground bunkle. The bunkle Clovel with field, the, the ten, ten and Clovel field. Lane. Yeah. Yeah. Lane. Yeah. Lane. That's where it was. I love that movie up until like the last two minutes. Well, she goes outside and uh, spoil old. She fights a <laughs> bunch of aliens. It's like it's not the same movie. It's just a yeah. it feels detached from the rest of the I mean, story. You could have went, could have went like the Disney version, and the outside was like a cartoon land or something. <laughs> yeah, take <laughs> like, Cloverfield the door. It was just like yeah. you know, uh, yeah. That's, that's like with movie, though. that's like with movies where the monster or whatever ghost or whatever it's like super creepy and ominous and scary, and then they show it. And then it's like it loses all its effectiveness. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, think about like waking up in the middle of the night and you you think you see something in the shadows. Mm -hmm. If you chill down the light and you realize, oh, it's just like a fucking vacuum cleaner. Yeah. So that's not scary. But if you leave the lights off, yeah. you let that mystery live on. Mm -hmm. Like um, in uh, Stranger Things, the first season, when they finally show the whatever the monster is like and all the lights in the school it looked awful compared to what it was when it was all creepy in the shadows and high yeah, yeah tree and stuff. I, I thought that too yeah. yeah like it just it ruined the effectiveness of everything before because now it's like well this it was just this dumb looking thing the whole time oh the uh right. the, the the original uh the original it the, the spider yeah. the spider <laughs> They didn't. Like, they didn't have the budget for that. I, I, I know, but you still, you're like, <laughs> or, what? The? Or the technology for that back then. I hope they stop trying to adapt that book. It's not a book that it should be a movie, full right. TV show. It's really much a book that should just be a book. I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's just it's too complex and it's too long, and it goes it is structural in a way that makes sense for a book, but I don't think it makes sense for like video. And I, I think, think the. Every, the old one and the new ones, like the parts with the kids work so much better mm -hmm. than the parts when they're adults. And I think that's I because of the back and forth with the book, the way it is. It's just yeah. the, the last half doesn't adapt very well. Yeah. Great book. Yeah. yeah it's a great book. Well, you guys should get Stephen King on the show. I, I, <laughs> I did. I, I put in a message, but. Oh yeah. I got just, nowhere. I, I, I tried uh Stephen King, Stephen. You Graham slipped Jones. into his DMS. <laughs> yeah. Uh, who else? I tried Stephen Graham Jones and, and a few other people, but no, <laughs> nothing yet. So. Yeah. So uh, but but actually, but, but we have a couple of biggies that we don't want to announce yet. Yeah, our next one's announce. Our next one's big. We're excited for it. Um, let me guess who it is. Give me some hints. Okay. Uh, I'll say one word: popcorn. Oh shit! Cool. I won't say who it is, but I know who okay. it is. 
That's he's a he's a good guest. Yeah, he's he seems pretty cool. That's actually next yeah. week, right? Yeah, next uh, week, uh, next Friday. That's gonna be fun. Congrats. That's a good Thank that's you. a good get. Yeah. We appreciate you coming on tonight, by the way. Yeah. You're you're, you're a big guest. We were we're you know coming up with our guest list for this season and we're like we have to get max on this this be a lot of fun so yeah we, fun. We, we don't want to keep it too much longer tonight because i mean i don't know what do you normally do on a friday night i don't know play with my dog i was gonna say <laughs> i was gonna say how's frank because he's been quiet for a while now he's napping but before yeah. we end i can get him up <laughs> yeah wake oh, him up from his nap okay. oh <laughs> did you wake oh poor fella you woke him up he looks as, okay. he looks like he's gonna fall asleep now. Yeah, <laughs> just laying back. Look so we're getting close to the we're getting close to the two hour mark, and we were talking about books. So what have you been reading recently? I know you did Echo recently and had a uh, Thomas on your show. Yeah, what have you been Echo was great. I just read. I have it by me. Bonding by Maggie Siebel, I believe That's is a cool how cover. you say last name. Yeah. Great cover. I she was on Foolish as well. The episode hasn't come out yet, but it's gonna come out soon. Great guest, great writer. I am also reading, I'm rereading She Rides Shotgun by Jordan Hill. It's a crime novel. I'm just a big fan of that book. And also the, the guy who wrote it. I'm looking at the books I have across the bedroom. Say, Echo had the best oh, prologue or whatever first chapter. Yeah. That was super creepy. I've read in a long time. Oh, definitely. Uh, we talked about that on the episode too. And yeah, it's just, that's just based on something that happened to him when he had a pee. <laughs> that's what he told me. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. And um, like I said, I'm going to try to look for those uh, those fantasy novels, the book of the new sun that mm. no one seems to know about. <laughs> but supposedly, <laughs> maybe, A Killing of My up. Friends is like one of the best book series of all time. Maybe they, maybe they lied. Maybe it's like, know. what is that? A snipe hunting. Maybe it's like a snipe hunt and it doesn't really exist. Might be. I might be going to half price books tomorrow for no reason. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. What about you guys? What are you what are you reading? Oh, you don't want to get started on that. Yeah, let's, okay. we got we got twenty minutes, Jay. Give oh, us geez. like three books you're reading. Oh <laughs> shoot. Uh the, the the Matthew Lyons book that's out next next month. Uh, uh, black Black and Endless Sky. Right, Black and Sky. I just finished Maggot Screaming. Uh the Roan Atkins book, uh, Arctic Sun reading that for uh, DT publishing um shoot i'm, I'm gonna start donald ray pollock this weekend i think the heavenly which table. one the oh, heavenly, heavenly table, table. yeah I, I, well i mean devil all the time is one of my favorites of all time so <laughs> me too yeah, yeah. same so good. i and, and uh ross jeffrey keeps telling me the heavenly table is better so i disagree i disagree bro, see i'm gonna I'm, it's I'm good gonna try to hop into it either it's good this, probably next week probably hop into it next week have you read um, his uh, collection, Knock 'em Stiff? Knock 'em Stiff. I I read a few stories out of it. I haven't read all of it yet. Yes. So pretty good. Pretty he good. lives like, like he lives like an hour away from me. I should just get him go, on the show. I know. I should just go talk to. Let's him. Go knock I on his door, Jay. But hey, what's up, man? Here's an invite. Um, That's a man who has many guns. I bet. Yeah, I, I know. That's <laughs> yeah. probably one reason why I haven't went to look for his house. <laughs> yeah. So uh, shoot. He would be a cool guest because yeah, uh, Devil All the Time was an awesome book. Yeah. So I mean I'm yeah that's enough for what I'm reading. So it's an endless cycle. Yeah. Brad, what are you reading? Uh, reading Born for Trouble by Lansdale. It's his newest happen litter collection. Comes out end of this month, I think. I'm still reading read uh, that. Do you like it? Yeah, it was good. How come? How come you're reading that right now? I wonder. It just sounded. I don't know. It sounded good. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty, good pretty, time. Uh, pretty pretty yeah. convenient time to read that one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm reading. I'm still reading. Uh, Spontaneous Human Combustion by I can't Richard Thomas is that his name? Yeah, yeah. that's his name. About halfway I read that. that. That was pretty good. I read that last month. It was pretty good. I'm reading Frankenstein for the first time. I'm enjoying it, and I know you had a sort of an homage to Frankenstein and Maggot Screaming, which was good. I oddly have never read Frankenstein. I need to. I want to, yeah. but I haven't. I, just, I love them. I love the movies. They it starts out with like four letters, and it's completely different than what I was expecting. How they're like traveling to the Antarctic. Yeah, on a boat. I was like, no, totally not expecting that. Oh, you're you're also reading uh, the something new by the future guest that we won't say the full name of. Come up for next week. Yeah, that's the first one I said. Jay, are you asleep? Did you? No, I no no I, I didn't hear you. <laughs> my, my bad. Because I'll probably dive in that that this weekend too. So. Yeah, born for trouble. 
happen, yeah. Leonard. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Well, because like, yeah, I know it was happen, Leonard. Okay. <laughs> I forgot. I forgot it was called born. Okay. Who could you be talking to next? Who could we be talking about? I mean, gee. <laughs> <laughs> I just totally messed that. We'll just cut that out. We don't, we don't so live. We, we yeah, don't it's live. Anything. We're good. No one, no one cares anyway. No one cares by, what we're by doing. this time. They're like, okay, we're we're out of here. If anything, you would give them something to look forward to. Now yeah, they're all excited. We well, I, I think I mean I, I would be advertising all these guests ahead of time, but Brad's like he's he's rough with this. He's like, no, yeah, it's like it's like a pop we up. Give, your we concert. give them four days of advertisement only. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just all right. Let's wrap it. Let's get out of here. Let, let's, let's 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 go enjoy our Friday night. You're an hour behind us, aren't you? Yeah, it's nine o'clock. All right, we need to get Pollock here. on the show where Tim McGregor will riot. Yeah, so I mean, I usually end with uh asking where people can find you. And I don't mean like physically, I'm talking about you know your social medias, all that, I mean, or physically if you want people to show up on your doorstep. If, if you way. do, I mean. Yeah. yeah, I my website is talesfromthebooth.com and you can find all types of links on that website. So go to that place, talesfromthebooth.com. Cool. cool. Well, much appreciation for uh, you know, taking time out of your schedule and coming and talking to two goofballs with microphones on YouTube here. Uh, we totally appreciate it. So hopefully you come back in the future. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. It's been another exciting episode of Paper Cuts for our special guests. Max Booth, the third, my partner <laughs> over there, Brad. My name's Jay. Till next time, stay safe. See ya. Love Bye -bye. you, Jay. Love you, Brad.